I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. I would like to say the smartest thing this next guest has ever done is throw me out of graduate school because that did happen a long time ago. He threw me out of graduate school. I just wasn't a good student and I even failed his class it was too hard for me, but that's not the smartest thing he's ever done. He's gone on to do many other very smart things. He's started many companies. He's helped many companies. Merrick first, along with his co-authors, Matt Chainoff, Daniel Saba, Mark Wegman. They have studied almost from a formulaic perspective, what is innovation? And what they came up with is an astounding way to think about anything, really. Like, I have used this concept for years. So as Merrick and I have discussed these concepts over the years. Now he's written a book along with his co-authors, Matt Chainoff, Daniel Saba, Mark Webin, The Heart of Innovation, a field guide for navigating to authentic demand. And it's really fascinating. It really opened my eyes about a common question. You have an idea. How do you know if it's a good idea or a bad idea? The answer is really, really difficult. And in the heart of innovation and in this podcast, we try to get to the bottom of it. Great book and a really enjoyable conversation. I hope you all enjoy it. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So... Merrick, the heart of innovation. I've, by the way, we've been talking for two hours before starting this podcast. We it's, just couldn't shut down the conversation. And you brought up the point that we've known each other. How long have we actually known each other? That's a really good question. Uh, Since 19. I think you were 20. You might have been 21. 89. You, you yeah. might have been 20 or 21 when we first met. Yeah, yeah, 21. Because I, I graduated college year earlier, early. And then you were one of the first classes I took in graduate school. I failed the class. Is that true? It was too hard. Yeah, I failed it. Okay. I did. Hey, I, I stopped showing up like halfway through. And I still, I, I still, final. I still have some tests from that time. If you want to take them. Oh, <laughs> so, if you have my test, actually, that would be. I would like to see my answers. That'd be pretty like, funny. How I even. I like don't. This. I don't remember that. Just for what it's worth, I don't remember your failing. Probably because I stopped showing up. Like you the, didn't I remember really you. Know I, me then. Well, no. So I remember you stopping showing up. That's another really? story. I do. Because oh, you know, it's complicated. Oh yeah. my god, it was so hard. But but back then you were sort of a 
I would say a mathematician basically in the computer science field. There was this yeah. overlap between mathematics and computer science. And it was an interesting time. We're gonna talk about the heart of innovation, but it was an interesting time in computer science because it was right after the Cold War had basically just ended right then. Mm. And it was right before the internet was getting big. So computer science funding from the Department of Defense, it sort of very momentarily like disappeared. Oh, that's interesting. So when when was that? Because when I first arrived at Carnegie Mellon, there was there was a boom in funding. Right. So, so when did you first these, arrive? What year? 1980. So we got the, there were this so big Star blocks. Wars funding was happening then. It's true. That was true. And but then after the Cold War, funding stopped. So there what was happened a big was problem. Oh right, I remember this now. So, so that's why Carnegie Mellon, which had always been a practical kind of school, mm -hmm. like they built things, suddenly had people like you. Uh, where or <laughs> Wait, are you saying I'm not practical? No, no but okay. like you, Dana Scott, all those people who were very much into the theoretical aspects of computer science, the mathematical aspects of computer science. That's a, so that was your perspective. There's a, there, yes. that's not, there's a different, actually closer to truth version of that. So in 1979, which is a million years ago, there was a, a visiting committee that was that visited Carnegie Mellon that gave them a report about how to compete. And at the time, there were only three computer science departments that were well-funded, there was a lot going on. It was uh, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, and MIT. And to compete, this committee, which was led by Michael Rabin, who's a famous mathematician, theoretical computer scientist, that report said, this place is great, Carnegie Mellon is great, but you're never gonna be, a, you're never gonna be able to maintain a first-rate computer science department unless you have a theory group. And so actually, when I was hired, Nico Hopperman, who was the chairman of the department, said to me, come here because you seem entrepreneurial and we have money and we want to hire theoreticians. So tell me who you want to play with and we'll go hire them. And so that it was the beginning of the theory group. In fact, I, I hired Dana Scott among other people. So, really? Yeah. So that's interesting. I think that's a good explanation, but I think my answer is still correct. <laughs> uh, well, I don't understand your answer exactly. So if, if you're getting, if the money was coming in to be practical, and the money was drying up. Why would you spend money on theory? Because you couldn't afford the you couldn't afford more robotics. <laughs> you thought we were cheaper. I see. So yeah, that's very interesting. You don't have to set up a robotics lab, huh? That's so funny. And so you do become competitive when you're able to weather the bad times when you have theoreticians. That's so interesting. I don't think anyone thought that. You might have been completely right. It was, it was usually people thought the other way, which is the theoreticians were like a waste of money because they weren't bringing in money. Right, they weren't Even bringing in money. But when you, so, there's no money to be brought in, you might as well have theoreticians. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, but I want to sort of push back. So if you're not bringing in enough money and you're trying to figure out like, what you should do would be the first thing you do is go spend more money on people who are not going to bring in money. That seems kind of intuitive. So maybe, actually, you, here's another view of it. There definitely were computer science departments at the time that were getting really good. Carnegie, uh, um, Princeton was this way, Berkeley was this way initially, and um, Cornell was this way initially. They were able to build up very strong computer science departments, almost all theoretical at the time, yeah. because they didn't have the money to like, spend on hardware, which was very expensive. So that's more true. So maybe the, maybe the answers sort of overlap. Like that's how to be competitive is to, you know, flesh out the areas where you could be really good without spending most of your time raising money. Maybe, then, then maybe. Because I mean, the guys. I, who, I always. I mean, I. I okay, I'll, I'll give you that and balance. So because they had very little theory. In fact, that there at the time when I came there, there were a few people who were theoreticians. John Bentley was a terrific guy. Um, was a student of Knuth's, I think, or at least worked with Knuth. And then there was a guy named H.T. Kung, who was a theoretician, who was like born again, though. He he found his way to do these parallel computing architectures, and at, at which point he decided the theory was really a bad idea. So, huh. so he was like, Cause he hated went, he theory. He turned practical. He turned practical, right. So, 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 but... One thing that stands out from this is you were, in fact, entrepreneurial and your 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 academic interests really transformed quite a bit. And you were an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley for a while, but you took a break from academia and now you're you're at Georgia Tech exploring this intersection between entrepreneurship and academia. And the question that you and I have talked about for such a long time, and now you've written this excellent book on it, The Heart of Innovation, and you've also put these principles into practice with dozens and dozens of of companies, many super successful, is, is there a way to, I don't want to say mathematically, but is there almost a formula or a, 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 a theor, theoretical way of thinking about innovation? And I love 
what you've come up with. It's changed my own way of thinking about innovation over the years, in part not just because I've read this book, but because because the book wasn't written, but just these mm. conversations we've had over literally decades. So let's talk about it. And I and and I and I want you to talk about it in the context first of when you first realized there was a problem and how you thought about entrepreneurship and innovation and the, the example of, I always forget the name, Dambala. Oh yeah, Dambala. Uh, yeah. So, well, first of all, I'd done a bunch of startups myself and I feel like I went up these two learning curves. Like how do you get successful in academics and then how do you possibly get successful at raising money and building things and selling things? So that there was that. But I always knew there, there must... Say you knew there's something wrong. Like when you look back and you have hindsight bias and you say something wasn't feeling right. So when we were doing early companies, we would like raise money, and there was always something that felt like it wasn't quite right. Like I was, we were con- people were convinced to invest, and you, and then people would be convinced to buy. Did you feel but, like you were not scamming is the wrong word, but did you feel like oh my god they believed us, <laughs> or did you have a feeling like that when you were when you were pitching VCs? No, it wasn't like that because that would have been more difficult to do. It was more like trying to figure out what to say or do to make it possible for people to invest, which is different. I'll tell you the very first time I ever felt this thing called authentic demand. It's it's strange. It was it's a really long time ago. It was when Ernest when Ru- Rubik's cube first came out, and nobody had Rubik's cubes. And uh, I first saw one. Bob Targin, is a theoretical computer scientist, was playing with one at a conference, and like everybody mobbed him and said, "We have to like play with it." It was really colorful, and you know, whoever saw anything that turned in that which that way. And then, for some reason, I was in Hungary at a conference, and I ran into a guy who was manufacturing these cubes. This was before Ideal had started manufacturing in the states, and so I had this direct line from Ithaca, New York, to Hungary to get like cubes by the a few at a time. And people were like, "What the people would see me and." they would just find a way to get me to get them a cube. And that was uh, that's just so memorable how that felt, that when there was actual demand and it wasn't okay for me not to get them a cube. That's what that felt well, like. But why and was it not okay I never, for them to not have a cube? So I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to contrast what it felt like when I was doing that and what it felt like when I was doing these startups. Mm-hmm. The difference was I was trying to, I was found, that there's a difference between trying to convince people to do something and then getting them to do it let's say, and what it feels like when there's actually an authentic demand and you feel instead of it, like you're trying to convince people that they should buy from you, they're trying to convince you that you have to make it for them. That's mm-hmm. what it feels like when there's authentic demand. So so if I look back and you ask me this question, like like when did it, um, I feel like I was doing something wrong, I would say in retrospect, it felt not authentic. It felt a little bit funny. I was trying to do things to get things to happen, which wasn't the same as filling this authentic demand. But the Dumbala story is a really good example, if I could tell that story. Yeah. Just to preface the story, this was a, a situation where it seemed like you had unbelievable authentic demand and and so many things were in your favor. Oh, we were so the convinced. the outcome, is, it almost seems unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. It seemed for it seemed like it was a certainty that it, was, it seemed really likely it was going to be successful. Yeah, so um, I was already at Georgia Tech and I had done startups in the Bay Area and the the world was kind of the world of startups was pretty much dead because two thousand two ish. Yeah, because of the dot com crash, there was no money. People were not making any bets on things. But just as the market started to come back a little bit, these three people from Georgia Tech, two professors and a graduate student, came and said. They had an idea for starting a business. They had this technology, and they knew I had started businesses and would I work with them. And what they described to me were these things called bots, which now everybody knows what bots are. It's like software that takes over your computer. And they explained to me how it went from being like fun that kids were doing to like get a worm on your computer to like put up a screen that was funny to bad guys in the former Soviet Union finding ways to scam you by having bots on your machine or, or to create problems on the internet. And and then from what I remember from you ex- just explaining it to me then that basic you were saying every every or most Fortune 500 companies had these bot armies already infecting their machines and just ready to go. Like they were like sleeper cells that were ready to be activated by hackers yeah, somewhere. Yeah, what these guys showed me is that they had put listening posts at various places in the internet and they those listening posts were listening for things that bots were doing 
but communication that normal computers didn't do. And so they had very complicated ways of figuring that out. And they, they showed me, like, like, I think at the time, like 17% of all computers on the internet that they could see were infected. And as they told me the story, it became clear that they were convinced, and it seemed convincing to me, it's probably still true, this was like a root cause of so many problems, so many tech, um, economically important problems on the net. One was that people's networks were infected, and that's, in fact, the company ended up making money do, dealing with that. But there was this other idea, which seemed, you know, I'll describe it to you. Um, companies like eBay were relying on the trustworthiness of their of their seller sites. And one way they could tell whether a seller site was trustworthy is that people would, like, buy from the site and then, like, click and say this was a good site, this was not a good site, a good experience. It turns out there was the following kind of scam that was going on, and it was going on a lot. Like someone would open up a site to sell cameras for ten thousand dollars and high-end cameras, but it was a fake site. But then they would hire these bot armies, so you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers around the world. They would that were being controlled by gangs in Russia, so former Soviet Union, and they would instruct those machines to go to that website and make pr- fake purchases. <laughs> that the website reported as real purchases, and then these machines would pretend to be real users and they would boost the rating of the site mm. until the site became like, I don't know, it was platinum seller site. And then a real person would go look for a camera on eBay. They would go to the platinum site that was judged by everybody else to be really good and they would actually spend $10,000 and then, of course, they wouldn't get paid. And then eBay had to somehow they make wouldn't good get on the this. camera. They wouldn't get the camera, they would get the money taken away, so it was like fraud. So the fact you could tell which machines were were fraudulent because we knew what their IP addresses were, we thought that would be really valuable. And it happens that I knew a guy, Howard Howard Schmidt. He passed away, so it's sort of... But I knew him because we were on advisory boards together, and I knew he was the chief information security officer at eBay, and so I told him what we were doing. So he was the decision maker. I thought... If anyone would know whether this was worthwhile, by the way, so you know, I had done startups before. I figured you don't do a startup unless they're customers. So before I said yes to these guys, I said, "Let me go find out if anybody wants to buy any of this stuff." So I talked to Howard, and he he immediately got excited by this, and we flew out to California, and he's like got his technical people and his business people, and he's they kind of went gaga over the idea, enough to say, "We think this will save us forty million dollars a year in fraud." Which, so they saw know, they saw a gain of forty million. Probably they could, even if more. They could, who knows? But you know, that's their. Mm-hmm. I guess they didn't have a good reason to tell me really, whatever the number was. So right. I think it was something like forty million. And they turned to me and said, "Can you really do it?" And I thought, "I'm working with really good technical people. They can probably do it." So I said yes, and then they asked me how much it would cost, and I'm like thinking to myself, "I don't know how much it costs to make it, but if you don't charge one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you can't like." make telephone calls to CISOs and so I said $150,000 and they didn't blink and I said to start and they didn't blink and they said go make it so I ran back to Atlanta and I started a negotiation with Georgia Tech and we started the company and um, we started to like we had no employees there was nothing and we put together a deck to try to raise money and I ran around and I think I gave six presentations and I got five term sheets because you have eBay potentially saying, yes, yeah, you're well, going to save us $40 million. I mean, million. The, story, the story was, look, these guys can do something magical. Let me show you all these banks and all these other places that are infected. I can show you their IP addresses, and I've got this guy. You can call him up, and he'll tell you that, that they want to use it. So we raised, uh, at the time, it was a lot of money, and I had $2.5 million on a $5 million pre, which was like sure. crazy from totally first-rate investors. And then we built it. But the interesting part of the story was, when we went, so and I replaced myself as CEO, and we had a technical team, we had the IP. They went out to try to sell it, actually close a deal with eBay, and they were just now indifferent to the whole thing. And it's not like they, he, he, Howard Schmidt was still there. And uh, I think Howard might have still been there, or he was just moving on, mm. but the people we had been talking to were still there. And at the time, it seemed impossible. Like it was going to save him $40 million. And it was going to cost them 150000 They told us to go make it. They were excited about it. We made it. It really did work. And then, you know, for every month, their board meeting, I, could, I would sit at the board meeting and I would hear the 
investors say to the technical team, how come they haven't bought yet? And the product manager would say, well, they asked us to integrate with this. So we made the integration. We went back and they said, well, can you like make it to give us this report? Or they just kept having these features they wanted to build. Now, here's the punchline. The punchline is now knowing what I think we've learned and what we wrote about in the book about authentic demand is whatever made me think that they would buy. Like it all sounded like they would buy. Like he was excited. Well, they said they would buy it. That, that they would said, make go think. make it. We're going to. I don't know if they actually said they're going to buy it. They said, go make it. We'll buy it. I, they probably said that. Uh, and they were excited about it. It was going to really save them money and we could really do it. And they didn't buy. And now I would say, there's nothing in that interaction, nothing in that interaction that should have led me to think they were going to buy. Even the words, we're going to buy it. So I don't know that they actually said well, let's that. Let's say they said that because it's not. So that I think is a little bit different. This, this will save us forty million. What does it cost? Oh my god, one hundred fifty thousand. Go make it. That sounds to me like we'll buy it. Which it sounded like that to me also. Yeah. Which is why I'm hesitating because if they actually said the words "we'll buy it," then you know they they represented something. Then I might have actually been able to push them to buy yeah. it. If they said things that made me think they were going to buy it, which is what I think actually happened. Yeah. They said, "Go make it." It really makes sense for us, those kinds of things. It would really save us the money. The reason I'm hesitating is uh, you've read Cialdini's book and you've read that work. People are influenced by being consistent. So if a human being tells you that they'll do something, it makes it more likely they'll, they'll, they'll do it. But you know, if, if I tell you I'm going to be here at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday, I influence myself to do it. So I, I don't think that's what happened here. But the bigger point is why is it, and this is what took me so long to get my head around. Why is it that I was convinced they were going to buy and they didn't buy? Like, why wasn't there actually demand or was there not demand? Now, you can make up all sorts of stories. Like, the people in the company thought, well, it's because of this feature or that feature, or because we have to wait for some budget cycle. I don't think it was any of that. I, I think the issue was, and this is looking back in retrospect, if I had been smart enough to say to them, okay, this would save you $40 million. Do you have other ways to save $40 million? I'm thinking they would have told me 10 other ways they could have saved $40 million. So if we, none of which they were doing. And so if we make one more way for them to save $40 million, it's one more way to save $40 million that they also wouldn't do. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge 
to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Could you have structured the offer differently? Could you have said, listen, we could sign a deal right now and we'll start immediately as a service, you know, creating this for you? Right. So you're asking a different, you're asking a question of, could I, as a salesperson, let's say, found a way to get them to buy something? And the answer is almost surely yes. First of all, he's a friend of mine. Second of all, probably pretty good at sales. If you get good at sales, you can get any given person to buy something. But that's not the same as having authentic demand for it. Right. So ultimately, and you you told me something very interesting at the time, which is that somebody actually says yes for many reasons. So it could have been that they said all these things and were very nice to you because they simply wanted you to leave the room. I tell people the story about this little girl. This, 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 there's this young woman. She works really hard. She has a terrible corporate job. It's Thursday afternoon. She's exhausted. She never gets to be home, never gets to really see her kid. And you see her walking up to the front of her house and just then, this cutest little girl you ever saw jumps out, runs out of the house and runs up to her and goes, Mommy, Mommy, I made you a mud pie, Mommy. I made you a mud pie. I made it myself. And it's just dirt and water. And the mother looks then at the girl, little girl and says, Oh, my God, that's the most gorgeous mud pie I ever saw. I can't believe you knew what I wanted. Thank you so much. So everybody in that situation is being authentic. The only thing is that little girl would make a big mistake if she thought that other mothers in the neighborhood wanted a mud pie. Right. And she'd be making a big mistake if she thought that this mother wants a mud pie tomorrow. So I got to tell you, I might have been like the little girl in that story going up to Howard Schmidt. You know, he knows me. He knows I'm a professor. We're friends. He's, I go up to him with my mud pie of this thing that would solve his problem. And he says, oh, that's the most beautiful mud pie I ever saw. Go make me one. And then I go home and think, well, like the little girl thought that I understood what was happening in that interaction. And, and what he sort of bought was basically six to 12 months of goodwill with you. <laughs> okay, yeah. And if I want to be really cynical about it, I think back on all the times that I was in somebody's office telling them something that I thought they would buy and they told me how great it was and I should go home and you know come back later. And that was an incredibly good way to get me out of their office feeling good about it. Yeah. And how many times are people doing that with you? So again, what could you have heard or what? You gave the example of Rubik's Cube, but what does what is really authentic demand? Like what... How do you start a company? Like, and you had all this evidence to think that your company was good. Even like, a lot of people have much less evidence than that. How do you start a company and and think that you are in a market where there's authentic demand? Yeah. So, it took a long time to try to get our heads around the questions because it's another way of saying that same question is what makes somebody a customer. So, if and I'll here's one thing that just it's really clear when you see it, but it's hard to remember it. If you're talking to somebody and you were hoping that they'll buy something and not buying is okay, they're not really a customer. If buying is okay and not buying is okay and they're really indifferent between the two, they're not a customer. So what's what's an example of indifference other than the eBay Dumbala one? 
Like, uh, the, what's a classic example? A classic example is uh, selling encyclopedias door to door. You know, they don't need the, you walk up to the door, they don't need an encyclopedia. They can be perfectly indifferent. But of course, in that setting, a good salesperson can find a way to make it so that not buying is not okay. And there's lots of ways of doing that. So, so the company that's selling the encyclopedias, their innovation is not necessarily the encyclopedia. It's the fact that they have this method of selling that's you're going to someone's house, you're putting them basically in a cognitive bias type of situation where it's hard for them to say no. That's right. And you just replicate that a lot and you build a big company. That's right. And it works particularly well with something like um, encyclopedias because encyclopedias can mean different things to different people. Like for some people it could be you're keeping ahead of your neighbors. For some people it could be you're doing something to make it possible for your kids to do well. For some people it's a beautiful piece of wooden furniture yeah. that, they, that they're going to get. And so a, a good, a trained door-to-door salesman can often enough find a way to make this encyclopedia be a thing which not having it is not okay in the moment. So again, it, it, that's the second time you've used this sort of double negative. So not having it is not okay. So here, here's, how I like to, here's how I've come to think of it. And maybe this is the computer science mm-hmm. mathematician part of me. Thinking about, okay, a human being finds themselves in a situation and, and I'm trying to understand or someone we're working with is trying to understand buying. Like, what does it mean that they buy? And, I, and I'm realizing, oh, well, you know, there's the buying, that's the activity, but there's all these other activities. There's all these things where they're not buying. So if you're, t- if you're able to actually explain that they're buying, aren't you also explaining that they're, the other paths aren't okay? Because the other paths, if all the other paths, if there are other paths are okay, then you're really not explaining to me what this buying is about. So that's this not, not principle, not buying, not okay. Is what you really is a easy, is a more clear way to be able to talk about what it means for there to be demand. So, so what's an example of something that that not buying is not okay? Well, everything you buy, <laughs> all the right, things. But like, what's, so, what's uh, one you can well, kind of walk through? Well, maybe look at it a slightly different way. So, what are things that how are situations? What are situations like that create these not not principles? Like not having a roof over your head is not okay. How do I know? Because every time I look at you, you have a roof over your head, and if I were to like knock down your house, with God forbid, or burn burn your house, you'll go stay somewhere else, and you'll have a roof over your head. So somehow people organize their lives that not having a roof over the head is not okay. So now show me a situation in which someone is not able to have a roof over their house, and give them a way to have the roof over their house. I'm thinking they're going to reach for it. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for situations in which something is changed in such a way that not doing something about that is not okay. One of the things I find really interesting about trying to explain this not not principle is how hard is it to see even though it's everywhere around you. Like let's look at the example of Uber. So yeah. Uber in in New York City in 2010 or whenever it was that Uber started getting big there. If you if it was raining outside and you needed to be someplace, it was not, it was not, not okay to, to, I don't know how to say it actually. Yeah, no, it's not, not, it's hard. It's funny to get used to it. It, it. it was, it was not okay for me to not have a car, be in a car taking me someplace. Yeah, that you can say a different way, which is like, you know, um, you're going to find yourself in a car, mm-hmm. right? Right. You're, and so you're going to, you're going to somehow get from where you are to there. And when you get there, you won't be wet. For example, you can right. say those and, kinds and, of things. And cabs disappeared when it rained because everybody knew. and and not and taking a cab is not going to happen because there are no cabs. Right, and right. so it was unacceptable for me to not have some way of, and I didn't want to take the subway. I didn't like it. So so it was not okay for me to not be in a car that was taking me to the place I needed to be, and I was getting wet. So Uber f- satisfied this really authentic demand that millions what? of people had. Yeah, one of one of what the ways to satisfy that. Right, so it's like cabs, subways. If I owned a car, or yeah. if somebody you have a friend you could call around, right. picking people up, and I had an app uh, that I could pick, find a car randomly. Yeah. I didn't want to call a friend because then I'm using a favor. So I really wanted well, it to be then, an, the anonymousness of uh, just crowdfunding the, or crowdsourcing and, the car. And you know, it's so interesting because the, the situation as you describe it was: I didn't want to call a friend. I wasn't calling a friend was not okay, and you made up a story about why. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that was the real reason. Maybe not. But the point was, maybe I had no if, I, if I understand, <laughs> well, that seems unlikely. Or um, I'm just saying, if you look at a human being in a situation, you can start to see things like, okay, well, James in this situation 
you're, you're not going to see James calling your friends. So you're not going to see James losing a cab because there are no cabs. You're not going to see James not showing up because he promised them they're going to show up. You're also not going to see James being wet. So you start to go through these kinds of things and then you say, okay, well, so among those, there's a, a demand for some means for you to get from here to there not being wet without calling a friend. Among those things, there might be, like Uber might show up. But there may be other things that could also happen. Like you could buy a car. Right, but I'm not going to buy a car. I didn't even drive. You could you could hitchhike. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't well, seen people hitchhiking in New York City. Yeah, so, I, 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 when I lived in Pittsburgh, I often hitchhiked, actually. It seemed safer you? there. Than, yeah, I would, I would race, uh, you know, like let's say, you know, Joe, Peter, my friends in, in Pitt, I you know, the, the guys I would have dinner with a lot, I would race them to Squirrel Hill. They would take Joe's car and I would hitchhike. Is that right? Yeah. That's really funny. So, and I would, I would often beat them, but so, yeah. So, so I just want the simplest way to get to where I want to be. There's no cabs. By the way, is that Joe Bates' his yeah. car? So yeah. he still has the same car. I just talked to him a few weeks ago. It was like a Saab or something? No, he had uh, like a Toyota, uh, one of these fancy, like um, Celica, I think. Well, yeah, that even then, I don't remember. I, I think maybe. So, I know, it's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny. By the way, his business was inter interesting and in a not not way, but we don't have to talk about that now. Yeah. But um, uh, so Uber seemed to satisfy this authentic demand and, then, and hence it became one of the biggest companies on the planet. Yeah. I mean, there's... I have a problem with all this. I mean, not all of this, but there's this, there's this, fun, there's this thing I just want to say. It's really easy to make up stories about what the authentic demands are when you stand back from them and try to guess what the authentic demands are. And I th one of the things that we saw happening with a lot of founders that sort of led me to all this was you'd work with founders or you'd work with people that are trying to figure out a business. And they would describe the situation in which their customers were and they would be convinced the customers would buy. That's exactly what happened to me with the guys at eBay. I described the situation. They have this fraud. They have these guys out there that are built, boosting up the websites. They're having to pay off on the, on the, make good on these things. It just makes sense. So there, I mean, why wouldn't you imagine that there's an authentic demand to stop that fraud? And so you're making up this story about what that situation is like that makes it seem obvious that there's an authentic demand for Uber. The, what we found is difficult is there's almost always something you're not noticing that you're not noticing about the situation that makes things not be authentic demands. So what do you think? I'm, I like, The thing is, as a, I remember the excitement I had the first time I got an Uber. And I'm just sticking with this example just for a second. Yeah. But like that excitement felt to me like I really wanted Uber over every other decision I could possibly make. There was no friction. Yeah. It was only minutes before a car showed up. It was raining. It was actually my daughter's yeah. birthday, so I uh, wanted her to have a good time. Um, and obviously there was a, I mean, the fact that you did it is, you know, just evidence on the face of it that you didn't take the other paths. So yeah. it could be random, you know, it could be, but or it could be unique. That was the only way to go. Yeah. Which actually raises a it, whole It felt other like it question. was the only way to go, though. Yeah, so that's ideal. If you create a situation for somebody in which not doing something is not okay and you provide them the only way of doing it, that's kind of interesting, but but if if it's if you're saying it's really hard to know if I if I'm telling the whole story, then how does any entrepreneur start a company thinking uh, he's fulfilling authentic demand? And I always so when I've started companies, one thing I always double check in myself almost every day is I called it smoking crack bias. Like, am I smoking crack? Am I just smoking this crack and thinking that everyone's going to love my product? When everyone else is listening to me and just saying, yes, it sounds great, show us when, you know, postponing the moment when I realize it's really a horrible product. And so I'm just smoking my own crack and thinking it's good. Yeah. So how did you check? Did every product you make when you, when I, you I checked? Would, I would check would by all, they all work? incrementally, like building in increments and seeing if there were users. Right. Which or I customers. Think, which, by the way, is not a terrible idea, right? So if, you, if there's no authentic demand, Maybe you'll get people to buy, maybe you want. But if there is an authentic demand, then you ought to see people buying or at least people taking action. The problem with that is, first of all, that doesn't always work, get you very far. But the bigger problem with that is like, what if you didn't understand the authentic demand? And you and you guess that there was that you start to see people buying, like the little girl and the mother situation and the mud pie. 
what was their authentic demand for there? So little girls thinking that she made this wonderful mud pie. I don't think the mother for a minute was thinking that she wanted mud pie, but the mother almost surely was drawn to have something from this little girl. The problem with trying to see what the demand is from the people's behavior is that all product is mud pie. Right. So, so, so you so, don't know why. Like for all Uber knew, it was exciting for you to see yourself being able to summon a car, and it wasn't about the ride. I, I'm not saying that was true. Right. No, I think I, I. And again, I see what you're saying that we don't fully know. But I just remember I really needed to be someplace, and that was the only way to get there. <laughs> and, right. But let me look at it from the entrepreneur's point of view. So my friend Jim Balcom got involved in this company called the Humminbird Fish Finder Company. So it was a while ago. It was like Heath, some guy named Yank Ding down in Eufaula, Alabama, which is like this little, at the time it was a super hick town on a lake. And they were doing bass fishing there. And he found these Heath kit systems where you could like buy them and they would have like sonar things. And he would like wrap the sonar in something that was waterproof, throw it off the back of the boat, put some squelch knob on something and he could use it to find fish. And he started this company called the Humminbird Fish Finder Company. And he built a product. So it's so basically a device that electronically, find, if you're fishing someplace, it finds out if there's fish nearby. And at, and at the time, all commercial fishing boats had these kinds of sonar things to be able to find the big schools of fish. So his idea was, okay, well, commercial fishermen don't have anything like this, or anglers don't have anything like this. So he would make something. So he started this company. When my friend Jim went down there, they were at about a million dollars in sales. Jim had just graduated from Harvard Business School. He had all the tools available. He pulled his young family down there, and he worked for a year, and they got the $6 million in sales. And then his partner died. The reason that's important is that Jim then took over the company, and he tried to figure out like how to make this thing grow. They estimated worldwide there was maybe $53 million of market. They were at $6 million, and they... He described, if you listen to him, it's very interesting. You hear his story, painful. He went through nine new product introductions, nine new product developments, nine new product introductions. Like that meant, means new features each Crazy, product? right? So they, they, they asked people like, well, how do we make it better? Or how do we get more people to buy? And they say, well, you know, it's sometimes it shows us like logs floating on the bottom as well as fish. So they improved the squelch mechanism and they like put better squelch knobs on. That got better. No change in sales. Now, each one of these requires like re-engineering and, and you have to deal with inventory, you have to do kind of marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, even one time, I think they were getting, must have been getting desperate. They heard from some people that they had two recreational boats and they weren't going to buy one for each boat, so they had to make a portable version. And each one of these was super expensive. So at the end, he was about to go bankrupt. They couldn't do anything. Six million sales flat, nine new product introductions, nine new product failures. And then one day, something happened purely by accident. And in many ways, what this book is about is how do you make this happen not by accident? How do you make this happen more deliberately? There was a woman working for him named Sue Simons who happened to find herself at a bass fishing shop. And down the aisle, on the fish finder aisle, I guess, she saw another woman reaching for a box. It was the Humminbird Fish Finder. And Sue said to her, would you mind telling me why you're buying that? And the woman told her the following story. She said, this weekend, I'm going to have to go out on the boat with my husband, and he is going to be in the back of the boat with his best friend. They're going to be getting drunk. And between me and my friend, we're going to have four kids. They're going to drive us crazy. I thought if I bought this for the boat, the kids would have something to play with. And Jim thought, you know, is desperation. Maybe I'm into the entertainment business or something like that. And he convinced his team, this is, can you imagine how hard this was? They were all trying to make the fish finder be better at a fish finder. He said, take off all the knobs and, and, and squelch things, make it look more like a TV set, make it visible in daylight, see if you can get more than just one color on it. And they went through a development process and did that. So first year sales, $75 million. Oh my gosh. Second from year six? sales from six. And in a market, they thought maxed out at $53 million. $75 million. Second year sales, $125 million. So here's, here's the so, insight. So did they, like it was entertaining for the kids, just seeing pictures of fish on the screen? or They had something to do while their father was getting drunk in the back of the boat. It, the insight was, as long as they thought that the job to be done or that the business was making something that found more fish, they were stuck at $6 million in sales. And you can, and you can sort of do this for yourself. Ask yourself, is it okay to not find more fish? Well, if you're a commercial fisherman, it's not okay to not find. But if you're a recreational fisherman, you're not. If you need to find more fish, go to the 
you know, the market and buy fish. You can buy as many as you want. On a boat, if you're, you're if you're not if it's okay to if it's not okay to not find fish, you're not getting drunk. So, on the other hand, is it okay to have a bad time on a boat when it's a recreational fishing boat? And the answer is no, it's not okay. And so, you, the not not was a much bigger space that he sold into, and he couldn't have seen that. So, what I'm what I'm trying to say is, a lot of people we also find have products which have kind of tapped out, where they made a mistake. They thought the market would be much bigger than it was because they didn't understand on what basis people were buying. Like, what with people's not-not? This is such a valuable service for all business owners, Big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite, from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and 1. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash james. That's netsuite.com slash james to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash james. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. 
So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, it, it sounds like the classic example of McDonald's. So... There's restaurants all over the country. So if you're driving along, there's probably some diner or whatever that you'll run into eventually. But I guess Ray Kroc's, one of his innovations is he realized that people wanted a, a clean, they wanted to know that the restaurant they were going into was clean. So the idea that every McDonald's is exactly the same and they're all clean, right. it doesn't matter how good the food is, it doesn't matter how healthy the food is, people want to know that they're going into a clean place. Yeah. And... So, so by branding McDonald's. And, and also it's going to be the same food. You don't have to worry about the quality. Right. You know, exactly. you're driving up to it, you know what you're going to order already. Right. Um, so, so there's a couple of not knots there. So it, it was okay to, to have any kind of food, but it was not, okay, it was, it was not okay to not have cleanliness and, and speed of order and. See, here's so what I really like about this way of thinking about it is that first of all, it just clarifies your thinking because now you could wonder whether or not those were the not knots that were involved mm -hmm. with the McDonald's thing. It's, there's, there's, maybe there's two sides to this. One side of it is I'm thinking the person's driving, they didn't bring food with them. Not having food is not okay. So, not having someone, a place to get food is not okay. And they have a lot of alternatives. They could go to a supermarket, they could go to McDonald's, they could go to other places. So, Definitely selling into something where there's some not not. Now the question is, why are they choosing McDonald's? And you're describing some things that might have made it hard to choose McDonald's. Like if the bathrooms were dirty, I suppose right. you had a choice. You could go to like a roadside diner or you could go to McDonald's. And for some reason, McDonald's has figured out somehow that not having a clean bathroom is not okay. Okay, they're going to end up at McDonald's versus the diner. Because also the diner has, uh, offers uncertainty. You don't know. The diner could say we have, we're the cleanest bathrooms in the world, but you just don't know. Whereas McDonald's, uh, over time, there was certainty. That's right. You know, the, like the stock market lows uncertainty, good, good or bad. If, 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 if there's uncertainty, the stock market goes down. Yeah. It's the same thing in the market for where am I going to go eat? Oh, if there's a McDonald's. I certainly know that they're clean. And, and this is related to something we were talking about before we started the podcast. We were talking about how situations create demand. So when people find themselves in it, the, one of the things we learned was, first of all, it's really hard to not be in this waking dream of thinking that you know why it is that people are, are doing things, that they you, you kind of make up the story in your head and it just seems impossible for you to believe they're not going to buy. That was my problem with Dumbala and, and eBay. It was impossible for me to believe they weren't going to buy. And so the fact they weren't buying made me try to do all sorts of things to get them to buy. But there wasn't an actual demand because it was. it turns out that not saving $40 million was actually okay, even though it was inconceivable to me. So one problem is we're just blind to those things. The, the other problem, though, is how do, you, how do you learn it yourself? Like, how do you actually find out whether it's true? And there, you asked me before what I probably should have said to the people there. I, what I probably should have said to them not was, would you buy it for 150000 I probably should have said, if I don't make it for you, is that okay? Like, you know, you, you seem like you're okay right now. Your eBay's growing like crazy. I'm thinking saving you $40 million is going to be a really good thing. Uh, help me understand, like, if I don't make this, are you okay? And if I, and my guess is I would have learned that, yeah, actually it was okay. And so that not buying was actually okay. And it was just in my head that not buying was not okay. So like for this woman who was buying the, the hummingbird fish finder thing, it was not okay for her to be bored all day and calm, calm her screaming kids down uh, when she could buy this one thing that and, would entertain And them. once she's there, I mean, I'm just now imagining this, but one, and once she's there and she sees this and now she imagines how much more pleasant this weekend is going to be, 
my guess is she couldn't spend whatever that whatever I don't remember what these things cost, but you know, a few hundred dollars. She wasn't going to spend that on coloring books because her husband wouldn't be okay with that, but she was going to spend it on, which might have been entertaining for the kids, but she could spend it on something that her husband would be okay her spending on. Like the situation's complex, mm. right? So there are a set of behaviors that she can do and there's a set of behaviors she can't do. And the reason I bring that up is what you're also not noticing or because you've already built it in is McDonald's has to construct the situation in which people experience McDonald's as having clean bathrooms. Right. If that's important to them, that's a... That's part of what people do. They construct the situation. So before a person's ever been in a McDonald's, they don't know whether a bathroom's clean. But once they've been in a McDonald's and people tell them that McDonald's bathrooms are clean, this is, by the way, assuming that your assumption is right about clean bathrooms being important. Well, they have, you know, the social proof. Whenever you go up to McDonald's at that time, there was like 10 million hamburgers served, a billion hamburgers served. So McDonald's is telling you up front, hey, been okay for a billion other people, so it's probably okay this, for you. And now this gets into the whole influence thing. So you start, we start to get interested. Okay, what constructs a situation? Well, one thing that constructs a situation is people are influenced. So, for example, you before you said, did he tell me that he was going to buy? So here's what I can say: If I can get someone to tell me they're going to buy, or if you can get someone to tell them tell you they're going to buy, simply because people are influenced by being consistent with who they are, it's more likely that they're going to buy. Right, so you could have done like the typical salesman technique, like, so I can put you down for a $150,000 order. Yeah, and if they say yes, they're sort of stuck. Right, so and if can, they say can, no, then there's a dissonance. And they so can't you, say no, really, at that point. Yeah, and if you, so one of the key insights in the book is that people are, the not-nots, these authentic demands, they come from the situation. And so... So again, like, but then, okay, this is a great concept that people can't not not have a car when it's raining in New York City and they need to get someplace. Or people can't not, not have this fish finder when they're bringing kids on a boat to be entertained. Yeah. But like, again, if I'm an entrepreneur and I have an idea, it seems like a great idea. Like, how do I know it fills this authentic demand using the not, not and formula? It's so, you know, having, I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, for those people that are entrepreneurs that are listening or we've had this experience with, it's really hard. The minute you have an idea for a product, it already blinds you. Like the minute that little girl had an idea right. for a mud pie and she could imagine her mother loving it, it it just blinds you. You can't really see your mother. Now, if the if little girl could have like deeply understood what was going on, it probably would have been this. My mother is probably feeling like I have forgotten her. And she's probably worried that her job is causing us to be distant. And if I could show her somehow that I spent some time thinking about her so that she knows when she comes home that we can be together and I can give her a way to show me affection, what do I need for that? And the answer is a mud pie, a lanyard, a picture. Note to self, uh, make mud pies for Robin when she is <laughs> out of the house doing something for when she comes back. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's funny. You make little love notes. Yeah. Like, I was thinking about you. I want to prove it it's to like you. A paper airplane. Yeah. Her name on it. <laughs> In crayon. Right. So the, but the insight there is it's not a mud pie. You see, all mud pies, pro, all product is mud pie. Like you don't know what its meaning is. So, so it, it seems like then the, the formula here, uh, the, the heart of innovation, the, the, this not not concept is we can all start constructing stories about what people can't not have. Uh, and there's many examples in the book, but this gives you ideas of what to innovate, but you still don't know really if you've hit authentic demand until you've made the product and are selling it. I don't know. Well, maybe. I mean, it, I'm not sure that's really right. So here's the experience that, w that we see happening. So 100% of the time, so it's like people say, well, how often does you know, people come up with good ideas? Are they the right ideas? So, so far, and we've done this with hundreds, many, many hundreds of founders and probably 100 startups already. They show up, sometimes they show up with like a million dollars in sales and we just tell them to stop because what we found is they don't actually understand yet why people are buying. What does it mean for people to buy? 100% of the time, their original idea, there was no authentic demand or, or it was really small authentic demand. So it turns out I, the problem isn't what product to make. The problem is to see the situations that your customers are in. That's the problem. Because once you see the situation and you see how it is that they're stuck in some way, like you were stuck at your house waiting for the rain to stop, you were stuck. In that moment, to be able to see how you were stuck, 
Like if, if you know, Uber must have figured this out for like millions, hundreds, tens of millions of people. There are going to be people who need to get from one place to another place. They're not going to be calling their friends. They're not going to have a car. They're going to have their cell phone. It's just the whole thing is to create that situation. And were we to be able to be with them in that situation, we might be a choice that they make because the other choices are not available to them. That's what authentic demand looks like. But the, the move to get to it, what we're finding is it's really expensive and really almost impossible if you start with the product idea. I see. So, okay, so give me an example from a startup you've worked with. Um, the funny thing about this, and I'll just tell you why I was he hesitated around this, is if it was really easy to see that there was authentic demand after the fact, you'd see a lot more success in investment. because Or before the fact. No, even after the fact. You can't tell the difference between mm. this. You can't tell. If you could tell the difference between a story that doesn't work and a story that does work, you'd have a lot more success in early stage investing because mm. people start out, nobody invests in a startup thinking that this thing is never going to work. Like you were telling me about the 140 um, yeah, love Yeah, 140love.com. You know, you were dating site for Twitter. <laughs> yeah, which is which, a great pitch to VCs. Uh -huh, okay. And, uh, I'm just saying, once you have the product idea, you kind of can't see the customers anymore because you're imagining what they're doing with it. Mm. So what we're finding is, and also from the mud pie story, you can see that if you watch people's behavior relative to product, you can't see anything. Actually, the story of Dumbala goes a little bit further. The company ended up, I think, with something like $12 million in revenue, which was perfectly fine. And maybe the market, the total revenue they could have ever gotten to was like $100 million. The total market might have been 100 million, so maybe it could have gotten to a 20 million revenue company, which would be fine, except that everybody who invested in the company thought the company was going to be a billion dollar company, and we raised $69 million, which is not going to be happy with a company that is small. Right. What that company did sell into, and this is me making up a little bit of a story, but I have some experience here. They would go to companies like a Federal Express and they would say, we think there are machines on the internal network that are compromised. 100% of the time when we put in a board on the internal network and monitor traffic, we're able to identify machines that are fraudulently controlled. And people would say, well, I don't really believe it. And so we'd say, okay, can we put in a, a board and you'll pay us some amount of money at the end of the month and then you can decide if you want to buy. So it's like proof of concept. And the end of the month, 100% of the time, we'd be able to show them that their, that their networks are compromised. And everybody who's working in the company and investing is sort of convinced, well, if you really can show every large company that they're compromised, every large company is going to buy from you. That just seemed impossible to, not, to imagine that people would not be okay with that. But there were times when our sales, salespeople would install one of these boards, come back like two or three weeks later and say, okay, you have a treasurer who's got a machine that's hooked up to the bank accounts of the company, and his credentials are being transferred in, in plain text to bad guys in the former Soviet Union. And they would go, oh my gosh, that's crazy, that's crazy. And they still wouldn't buy. And why is that? You, no, so I'll go the other way around. You're asking the wrong question. You, you, you're imagining that there's like, why don't they do it? And I'm just saying, it's obviously okay for them not to do it because their yeah. company is doing just fine now, even though their, their treasurer right. credentials are going out. Right, you, so, you can't imagine that it wouldn't be okay, but so okay. So here's what I would do as yeah, a business strategist. Yeah, tell me, you were selling that proof of concept, right? Like you were putting. Yeah, but, but this is a numbers game. So what you're telling me is it was a numbers game that some percentage of people who are some percentage of companies that are infiltrated by bots, it's not okay with them that they're infiltrated mm -hmm. and they will buy. So you just needed to give for free the proof of concept, so you would have as many proof of concepts as possible. Yeah. So yes and no. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a much smaller market. That's why I'm saying maybe there's $100 million total market you could sell for people that actually cared about whether or not, that cared in the sense of it's not okay for them to not do something about it. Now, there were some companies that would absolutely swear by this. They had to have it. They couldn't imagine us taking it out. And it turns out, I'm convinced in retrospect, of course, we can't go back in hindsight, they were doing something else with the product. They weren't simply identifying the machines internally that were compromised. Because that software could also prioritize which machines they could go fix. So if you looked at the companies that bought, there were some companies that had an internal staff that they would send out every morning to go wipe the machines they were worried about. For those companies that had a, such, a, such an internal staff, there were more machines to wipe than they could actually have people go wipe. So at the morning, they had to figure out like how they were going to allocate their staff to go to those machines. 
those companies, when they bought this product, they couldn't not have it. The rest of them, not so much. So you see, because, and, and that market, was probably the $100 million market, mm-hmm. kind of like the fish finder market. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, how many people can actually go without knowing like, which machines are the ones that are most compromised? The answer is a relatively small number. You see, you see what I'm saying? And so because the company didn't understand what the authentic demand was, and it fooled itself to think the authentic demand was something else, the company raised too much money and made bad decisions. Right, so, so it's very interesting. Like You take that fish finder thing, the way she was able to sort of, it's almost like you have to stumble on the authentic demand through the approach that this Sue Simons did, which is simply querying people at the moment of purchase. They're in the situation where they're about to purchase and, or, or just querying as many people as possible, like asking questions to as many people as possible. Like, why are you buying this? Or why didn't you buy this? You, you, you've... I, yeah, wouldn't it, so if that worked, I would say we would, people do that already. Mm-hmm. I mean, they do that with surveys. They do that by focus groups. So here, here's, you know, here's the painful experience. The painful experience is it's really difficult to see people. Like, so so and, given, given this, though, and given the, for, the formulas you describe in here yeah. and this overall equation of what things can people not, not have in their lives, what, what, I'm an entrepreneur. How do I take this and build a company? Yeah, yeah. So it's a great question, which, of course, and by the way, not just entrepreneurs. I think the same, the same thing is true for anybody who wants to Anybody who be wants unstuck. something from someone. Well, you say it like anybody wants something. So people feel stuck in their lives. So mm-hmm. entrepreneurs feel stuck. Now looking back yeah. on this, I'm realizing here's what we really were doing. We were taking people that wanted to create startups and they weren't of value. And they, they tried to become of value. So, and, and what that meant was they were doing something that they felt like they should do and other people cared about what they were doing enough to pay for it. That's what it meant to be of value. Same thing in large corporations. They're trying to build a new product line or go into some new business. They're trying to figure out how to be of value in some way that's different than they currently are. The same thing I think is true for human beings. It's like you take a person who's currently feeling like, well, I'm not really where I'm supposed to be. I'm not, I haven't figured out how to make the thing I'm supposed to make or be the thing I'm supposed to be. And what does that mean? Well, if they're not interested in being it, then it's definitely not right. And if they're interested in doing something and other people are not interested in their doing it, it also doesn't feel right. I was just having coffee yesterday with a friend who loves to write, but he feels unfulfilled. Why? He loves to write, but no one's reading, <laughs> so he doesn't feel fulfilled. Now, if people were telling him what to write and didn't feel like writing it, he would also feel not fulfilled. That's the place that entrepreneurs, I think, are trying to get to, is a place where they become of value. So then the, there's two parts to that. One is you got to figure out about yourself what's not okay. Like it's not okay to not what? I don't know. But then the other side, the puzzle is not what should I make, but tell me people you're interested in and it's not, and f- go understand them well enough to see what it is that's not okay for them to not be. And, it, and you think of it in terms of product, and I think of it in terms of differently. I think to myself, my customers are stuck. Like, they're stuck. Somehow they're stuck. Like there's, there's, the world's just not okay for them. And they're not, I, they can't tell me that. It's like they're, they get up in the morning, they go to sleep at night, they're expert at what they do. They don't necessarily feel stuck. But if I can see how they're actually stuck, maybe there's something we can do that gets them unstuck. And that's, and that's our value to them. Our value to them is we show up in that situation in which they're currently stuck and then not reaching for us wouldn't really make sense because not reaching for us is not okay. That's, that's the move to make. And then the question is, well, how do you see that? How do you learn to see that? How do, you, how do you put in place a process that allows you to start to see your customers for how they go about being themselves and understand how they're stuck? Customers or potential customers? Yeah, it's potential customers. Mm-hmm. So another thing we found is it's almost always the case that for entrepreneurs that come in, who they think are their customers aren't actually their customers in the end. Like the general space that they're in is real, but I'll, I'll tell you, you asked me about a, an example of a company that we worked with that's doing extremely well. It's called Florence Healthcare. I just love these entrepreneurs and love what their business has turned out to be. When they showed up, they had an idea, which was they wanted to do something in the healthcare space and maybe in, in clinical data recording. And they knew that there were people who were like sending out visiting nurses with iPads or they had, they were sending up visiting nurses to like visit patients that were on some drug trials or something and they were like writing things down and then bringing them back to central, excuse me, the contract research organizations. And it was all paper-based. 
And their fantasy, which seemed like a really good idea, was, well, now we have iPads. Why don't we give them forms that they can carry around and they can go into the people's houses and they can just click, click, click. It would go up to the cloud and then they wouldn't have to do all this copying and all this extra work. Um, and it seemed like a really good idea. People suggested it was a good idea. They had a physician who joined the team. They had a technologist who joined the team. They had a CEO who had been some, somewhat successful already. And it turns out there's no authentic demand for that. I mean, there are many reasons that there's no authentic demand for it, not the least of which is a lot of the places they were going, to, they were like in basement apartments with people who were quite ill and there was no Wi-Fi. So that already kills that idea. But they spent a lot of time thinking that, okay, people in the contract research organization are complaining they're, they're saying things like, it's all paper-based, we hate the fact that it's paper, and they all want something which reduces the amount of paper. So then they would try to figure out a way to do something that would reduce the amount of paper. Turns out, that's true, but it's actually okay to have all that paper around. How do you know? Because they're all the paper around. And what's weird about these authentic demands is they're almost never the things that people actually have names for. Like when, here's one of the insights that was really weird for me. People would come to talk to us and they would say, um, people are going to buy this. And I would say, why are they going to buy it? And they say, well, it's going to save them money. And I would say, well, what makes you think that saving money is an authentic demand? They say, well, people are always trying to save money. So, so I say, okay, well, go back to those people and say, how much are you going to save them? You're going to save them $10, $100, Ask them if they have other ways to save $1,000. It's like what I was, it's the question yeah. I should have asked the people. At, but it, there's a kind of, you know, observation. Anything which ends in the letters ER is not an authentic demand. Better, faster, cheaper. You know, say you want to do that faster. Okay, can you already think of ways to make it faster? They'll always tell you, yes. Are you doing any of those? No. So that basic idea isn't the right idea. So if you go in and say, I see there's a lot of paper and you're complaining to me about the paper and you want to solve the paper problem, so you're going to be better off, there's going to be less paper and I try to sell you something which is going to be less paper, you should also ask the question, do you have other ways to reduce the amount of paper? And they'll almost always tell you yes, and you'll discover they're not doing those. So you have to worry about that. The reason I tell you that is authentic demands are weird. Like when you see them, they're just true, and you would never guess they were true. Mm. And I'll tell you what, what these guys found, or some version of this. They watched, and they saw what people were doing. These, they would get the data from the um, electronic health record, and then they would have to print it out in order to get it to the pharmaceutical companies. And they would print it out, and they would have to go through and redact information by hand. They would have to like take a black marker and by hand redact the information. And then they would have to take these forms and run around the hospital to find the doctor to sign off on it. Well, doctors aren't in the hospitals that much, and doctors don't want to tell you where they are. And so these people that have to get the data from the EHR, the health record, to the pharmaceutical companies are definitely going to do that but the way they're going about doing it when they have it on paper is really pretty unpleasant for them. So our guys showed up and they created this thing called an e-binder. And the feature that was in the e-binder, which they didn't specify was the important feature, was that once you saw this, you realized you're never going to have to go and redact things by hand again. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to have to go chase around the hospital and, and try to track down a doctor. And you ask yourself, okay, these people, they're... You know, they're, they're filing people, they're data people. Is it natural for data people to be redacting? Is it natural for data people to be running around looking for doctors? None of those things are natural. They're doing it because they have no choice, but they're stuck. That was the start of this business, which now is in many, many, many thousands of um, so, so what's contract research. What's their research. product now? What's their... their product started out being an e-binder, which they sold into these contract research organizations, thousands and thousands of them. Now that they're in so many of those contract research organizations, they've become like a data standard, and now they can sell products to the pharmaceutical companies who have a lot more money to be able to have access to these e-binders and then have to put PhDs on airplanes in order to come get the data from the contract research organizations. And so how do they ultimately figure out, like you have to kind of dive into the whole industry and they realize, oh, these data analysts are doing things that are not really in their job description, but it, they have to do it. Right. Well, they're, they're sort of in the job description. So here's what we've learned, that um, you want to go see customers for being for how they're going about being themselves. You want to go see that. That's the hard part. How do, you go, how do your customers go about being themselves? To understand their situations. On the theory that behaviors are mostly situationally determined. 
And if they're not situationally determined, then I'm not sure how you as a business person is going to actually do anything for them because what you have access to is their situations. So you're looking for things that they're doing or not doing that are in the way of they're trying to get somewhere. In this case, like here's something that they're doing. They're erasing things. And that's in the way of their being themselves. Like they have other stuff to do. They have, I don't know what, what they don't think of themselves as, as redactors. So if you can see things that they're doing, which if they can't stop doing it, they don't feel right. And you see the things that they're not doing, which if they can't start doing it, don't seem right. And that's what your product does. So your product is allows them to change behaviors that are currently in the way of they're trying to get where they are. So I'm thinking about my first business. So yeah. in the in the ni- mid '90s, the web was first getting known. Not every company had a website. Yeah. So like companies like American Express didn't have a website, and my first business was designing and doing the software for websites for companies. Right. So like I did AmericanExpress.com. Relay, I remember the company. Oh yeah, Reset. Yeah. Reset. Yeah, yeah, Reset. Yeah. And uh, we did American Express. We did. HBO, Time Warner, we did a hundred companies, their websites. And there wasn't really authentic demand because at that time was in this weird spot where half the people you talked to thought the internet or the web was just this scam or fad. And half the people were like, okay, but this is going to cost me money and it's not going to make me money yet. I don't understand. And so there wasn't really pure authentic demand. There weren't users on the web yet. There was just excitement about the potential of the web. And, and really, so, so I had to kind of create the demand through sales. Like I believed that they would need this mm-hmm. and that all their competitors are going to get this. And so they need to get it. They, it's not going to be good. And all their customers are going to be buying their services on the web. So it's not okay for them to not have a website. But I had to convince them of that. There wasn't really, a, they didn't come calling for me. I had to call them and convince them through sales I techniques and through storytelling that that I had this theory where I could be I could have been wrong. I had this theory that they're going there's going to be authentic demand for this. So the question is, am I lucky because it did turn out that there was authentic demand for a website, you know, later on? And some people who are trying to make authentic CD ROMs for them at the same time weren't lucky. Uh, and yeah. So well, first of all, anybody who's successful, they should realize it was lucky. Mm-hmm. And anybody who's unsuccessful should realize it was probably luck. All, uh, unsuccessful was probably luck, also. So, yes, you were lucky. Uh, so, I have another friend who's a really great salesperson. He ended up being super successful, and but he started his career selling um, land around the lake, so lakefront property. And he he would tell here's here's one of the things he would do. He would get in the car with somebody who was like coming up on the weekend looking for like front property, and we talked to that person for a while to try to get to know them. And this person, for example, that he told me the story would t- say, he would say like, well, so what do you do? And the guy would say, well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm in the stock, I'm a stockbroker, I'm, or I do stock trades. And the guy, and he, my friend would say, well, so wow, in that kind of business, you must, uh, you know, mu- you know, how do you make that work? And he says, well, I see things that other people don't see. Like I see opportunities and other people don't see those opportunities. They said, well, tell me a little bit about what you're trying to make happen with your family. He says, well, I, my father you know, always said he wanted to get us kids together, but we could never do that. So I'm imagining I have a lake where I can bring my kids up on the weekend. So my friend knows, here's what he's heard. He's heard this guy thinks of himself as somebody who's going to have a place where his wife and kids are going to be able to come and spend weekends, and it's not like what his father was like. Not only that, this guy thinks of himself as the kind of person who sees opportunities where other people don't see opportunities. And he, ha- my friend, happens to know that there's one part of the lake where there's a, it's very swampy, and they've been having a really hard time selling that, and because everybody goes there and they see it looks like quicksand. And so he turns to the guy who's in the car with him, and he says, uh, "You know, I may have just the thing, just perfect for you. It's a place that most people can't see." how important it is. to it, It's like super underpriced because people can't really see the opportunity in it. And it's a place where it's perfect for kids to swim. Let me take you, would you like to see that? And the guy says, sure, I'd like to see it. So now my friend gets on the on the, on the on this like, back then I think they were using walkie-talkies. And he says, 
you know, I'm taking every, I'm ta- he has a certain way of saying it. I'm taking this customer to lot number 72 check or something. The check means, please, when I get there, about 15 or 20 minutes later, say on the, get someone else to say on the line that they're going to send somebody there because they're now interested in that lot. Mm. So he takes the guy there and he says, now, most people would see that swamp and they would see that, that messy land there and they wouldn't ever buy this place. But I have, I have a feeling that you're the kind of person who could realize that this is just an underpriced property and if you put up some pillars and you put a deck over that, be no problem. And right then, when the guy is like almost on the hook, he hears on the radio, I have a, someone who's, who saw that space and is really interested in it, lot number 75 or 79, whatever it was, and, and they'll be there in 20 minutes. I just want to let you know, so if you wanted to take off, you should take off. At which point, this guy now is feeling the sense of, what does it mean to not buy that place? It's like he's saying, essentially, I'm not the kind of person that sees opportunities and seizes them quickly. I'm not the kind of person that wants to have a place for my kids. And by the way, I'm now I'm not the kind of person that wants to get ahead of the other person who wants to buy this from right now. So he, that's how he would do sales. So it's interesting, and, and it, my, borrowing my, from Robert Cialdini, that those two techniques, he's using consistency, like the person wants to be consistent with what he said he was about, and he's using scarcity because, oh, we only have 20 he, minutes left. He constructed a situation in which not buying was at least plausibly not okay. And I'm saying, okay, how's that that different from what you were telling about Reset? No, it's the same thing. Uh, the only thing, and, and, and so A, on the one hand, it feels like using, that's using a little bit of a scammy, Kind of technique. In 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 that case, he's actually specifically being um, a little scammy. By there may or may not have been a customer coming in twenty minutes. Now with me, I'm con- telling a story whereby I'm creating a future where there's a, it's not it, it it's not acceptable to not have a website. Yeah, you and, could deliver something. Right now, I might have been wrong about my theories of the internet, but I was. Honest and about what I thought was going to happen. Well, but in, in the, spe- I mean, you're thinking like the bigger version of this, but the specific transaction is you're talking to somebody that has a marketing budget for whom not having some way of putting their stuff out there, they're going to spend money on something. They're going to spend money in magazines, ads, they're going to newspaper ads, or they're going to they're going to put up posters. Okay, so there's a budget for doing that kind of thing, and you're talking to somebody who has that budget, and you're pre- you're presenting them some other way of spending that. Budget. So the authentic demand there was it was not okay for them to get their message out. Right, and so I had to I had to basically build the better not not story than other or, people who were or, selling it to them. Or in the category. So at this point, there's no website category. Right. You're saying that you pre you you predated the website category. But there's a marketing category. There's a marketing category, and so you were able to make your product sound like it was in the marketing category, and you were distinct enough that someone could buy from you. Right. Now you happen to be really lucky or really prescient to realize, wow, this is going to get to be really big at some point. So if you build up the capacity, you're going to get a lot of demand. But but like here's where here's where I messed up. I created a problem for them, right? So suddenly now they have to maintain a website and suddenly now they're spending a lot of money that they didn't even to to buy something they didn't even know existed a year ago. Yeah, I love this. So so what I didn't do, I I wrote software to rate, make all my websites what I really should have realized is that now that I created this problem, they needed to easily and cheaply build and maintain websites. And that's really the billion dollar market was the WordPresses that, that made websites easily and cheaply. You can make a website for free now yeah. and, and maintain it for free. I had all that software written, but I didn't tell them I was how using come? this software. Yes, how, how come? How come you missed it? Because I didn't understand business. I thought people are paying for my time to do something, like my hard work to do something. Yeah. If they knew how easy it was, because of software I had written, if they had knew how easy it was to make me you know, uh, make them a website, they wouldn't have paid me $200,000 to build AmericanExpress.com. So let, let, me, let me just, because what you just said is actually, um, I, I think all that's right, but there's something else that people don't notice when they're looking at customers. I call it looking through the customer. It's like they, you, you see the customer but instead of actually seeing the situation the customer's in, you, you look through the customer on the thing that they're trying to make happen, and you think that's your job. In the yeah. fish finder case, the, the mistake that, this, that Jim would tell you is like, okay, the name of his company was the Humminbird Fish Finder Company, the name of the product was the Humminbird Fish Finder, and it found fish. And then when he would talk to customers, they would tell him how to find fish better. But actually what he was missing was, 
these were human beings that were in recreational fishing situ situations, and they were living with the fact that in recreational fishing situations, when they're looking for fish, most of the time there's nothing to do. He didn't see the customer in the situation. If you, what you've just described is, you walked up to them and said, you have an advertising problem, you need to have a website, I'm going to make a website for you. You, you took on their problem, and if you could have kept looking at them and watched, okay, what's their situation? Their situation, once they have that, is now going to be something else. It's going to be really uncomfortable for them to have not only have a website, but now they have to maintain it and there's all the other and things. And they have to spend the money on it. They have to make it, the, and, they have their budgets. And so drag. now, because now you're interested in them in their situations, in that of instead of trying to solve the problems that they have in order for them to be do their jobs. The holidays are back at Starbucks, and so is the peppermint mocha. Made with a dash of festive peppermint flavor, delightfully comforting mocha drizzle, and smooth, rich Starbucks espresso. Festive is a tap away. Order on our app today. It's time to save. Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, take an extra 25% off clearance. All sales are final. Hurry, shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see NordstromRack.com or ask a store associate for details. So in practical use, like I had an enthusiasm about the internet and the web. Yeah. So I was able to, and I had no money and I didn't understand venture capital. I didn't understand raising money. So I needed to sell something where I was making money day one. Yeah. Otherwise I couldn't do it because I had no money. So, so I solved a solution for me, which is how can I do make money doing this internet stuff, oh, people need a service. I could sell them this service and, and convince them that they need this service or that they can't not do without this service. But if I sell them something that's more product-like, that's actually a harder sale in a weird way. I'd have to raise money. I'd have to really make a product. And that was hard for me. I couldn't really do that. But maybe it wasn't the right time anyway. It might not have been the right time, right? So not knots are time. It's like you say, situation dependent. And part of that situation is what's the state of the world in? That's right. So, so I'm just trying to think from a practical perspective. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a new, let's say I'm a new entrepreneur. I, I love this way of thinking. This is the, seems like the right way of thinking to me, this not, not way of thinking about things. What can I make that people cannot not do without? Uh, seems very smart way to think. But now what's my next step then? So, well, first, I, can I just adjust that? Mm -hmm. To make it real pra really practical, ask yourself the following question as an entrepreneur. Not like, can they not not have this? Rather, what makes all the other alternatives currently okay? Because if all the other alternatives are currently okay, then you probably have nothing to sell them. Yeah, and I've, seen, I've been involved and, in companies like that plenty of times too. Yeah. Where... So you, what you want to do is look at people and see how it is that they're kind of going along right now, seeming like they're indifferent, but they're actually not indifferent. The, the killer is indifference. Like if they don't care, you got nothing. So when you spend time with people, what you're trying to see is how is it, instead of asking yourself like, what could I make? Which I think gets in the way weirdly, even though it feels like the right thing to do. Right. It blinds you. You ask yourself, can I understand how it is that they're able to be indifferent? Because you're coming in and you're pretty smart. If, you would, if I would have said to you with this website thing, it's like, Instead of going in and pitching them on the website, I wonder what would have happened if you said to them, how is it that you guys are okay not participating in advertising in this space? How are you okay with that? Like, how come that's okay? And the answer would have been, well, if it's actually okay for them, then you have nothing to sell them anyway. This is, and this is the, one of the counterintuitive things that we find ourselves talking to entrepreneurs and also innovators and also individuals. It's like so safe to ask people, like, if we don't do this, are you okay? And the reason is, if it's okay, if they don't, if you don't do it, they should let you know, and that's good for you. But but I have, I have a question about exactly yeah. that. So let's say I hear a song on the radio, and I'm like, oh, that's a neat song. But I I've, I've known this song forever, but I forget what the name of it is. I really want to know the name of it. Mm -hmm. But it is okay for me to not know the name of it because it's my whole life. I've not known the name of songs that I hear on the radio. But then a software platform like Shazam comes along, and now on my phone I could just hit Shazam. It'll listen to the song and using AI. Tell me what the name of the song is. How did they kind of figure out that it was uh, not okay for me to not know? Even okay. though it has been okay my whole life, 
Now that Shazam exists, it's not okay for me to not know the name yeah, of the song. Yeah, so of course in situations like that, you know, making up stories post hoc, like could you have figured it out? And they guessed right, but I'll make up a story. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you hear that song and you think about that, you, someone might notice that I, they, they themselves have heard a name of a song and they don't, they don't know the name of the song. And at that moment where you kind of have this momentary sense that there's something that's not okay that you want to get a grip on, Ask yourself the question, what could I do right now that I'm not doing? And, or what am I not doing that if I start doing it, I could solve this problem? That, that's sort of the key insight. It, maybe it's easier to think of it in terms of um, more concrete things. There's this wonderful story that Bob Keegan tells uh, in his book, Immunities to Change. You can start to see it. There are people who at some time want to lose weight. Not everybody, not all the time, but it's really hard to lose weight. And they can tell you all these stories about what they've tried to do. But, but a really interesting question to ask someone, if they're actually drawn to lose weight, is this question. And it's, if it's kind of in this not, not framework. It's backwards from what you think. Say to somebody, are there things that you're doing right now that if you keep doing them, it's going to stop you from losing weight? Or are there things that you're not doing that unless you start doing it? And people can answer that question. They would say, yeah, if I don't go to the gym. If I keep not going to the gym regularly, I might not lose weight. Or, you know, when the waitress comes on a Friday night or the server comes on a Friday night and asks me if I want the dessert menu, as long as I keep saying yes, I'm not going to lose weight. That person is stuck in the following sense. Not losing weight is not okay. We call it an aspirational grip they're trying to get in their lives. And yet, there are behaviors that they're doing, which if they don't stop doing them, are going to be in the way. And there are behaviors that they're not doing, which if they don't start doing them, are in the way. Products make it possible for people to change those behaviors. So if you want to take the Shazam example, you'd say, okay, do people find themselves in a moment where they feel stuck in the sense that not knowing the name of the song is not okay? Right, I see what you're saying. So for that, even though in general in my life it's okay to not know the name of that song, in that one moment, if I had a way to know the name of that song, I would not not use that method. Well, I wouldn't even... But you even you even went to have a way. I would say, are there things that you're doing or not doing right now? It's just we could just play that game. So you yeah, hear right. a so song, I could record I could record the song and then put it on Twitter and say, can anyone tell me the name of this song? Okay, there's something you're not doing, and as long as you keep not doing that, right, and that's okay because it's too much work. Well, I don't know, but I'm just saying, you're, but you're not doing it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, the thing I'm going to first do is I'm going to explore all the things that you're not doing that are in the way, and all the things you are doing that have to change to stop doing them in the way. And then the work, the product work is, are there any of those things that I could do some, help you do something about? So, right. So, so with the, in the eBay Dambala example that you told earlier, it, it, it's like they were, none of the people were feeling stuck because exactly. they didn't have this solution. Like their lives were, were moving on and they, they were happy with their jobs. They weren't like frustrated. No, nobody was sitting there with a budget that was going to get fired if they didn't save this $40 million. Right. It's interesting right now you put it that way. Like right now, so I'm invested, for instance, in one company that does some AI stuff. And um, he was telling me the other day, and for years they had kind of flat to no sales, like very little sales. And he was telling me the other day that suddenly everybody who's rejected them in the past is calling them now because they're being mandated by the CEOs. Every department in the big companies yeah. is being mandated by the CEOs. You have to now figure out AI solutions in your department. HR, right. finance, marketing, we, where's, where's the AI solution? Yeah. And so now they're being called like, look, we got to spend, it's October, we got to spend this money by December 31st for an AI solution to what we're doing. Yep. Now he's getting the cost. Right. Yeah. So there's a situation that changed and it became a not, not. So, and he was in the right place at the right time. What I also find interesting is, okay, if you're decided that you want to become of value or you want to build a business that's of value, here's an approach. Figure out somebody you care about. Better to be somebody you know something about, like a, or yourself. It's okay to be yourself, but it's you know it depends. You know if you're like a yourself in a co- in college, mm-hmm. college students aren't that interesting in market. They don't have that much money. So you want to find a way that you're yourself in a certain setting in which there might be some. Mm-hmm. In the end, although it's funny you should say that, I I think it, it's I my my friend Eric Gold says every time he hears me say the words I think he stops listening. Because it's you know it's like a made up story, so I don't want you to stop think, listening. But 
I want to I want to avoid saying I think something we've we've seen a lot with entrepreneurs when they come in with a product idea or they come in with some market. There's almost always something that for them is a not not. There's like not building this is not okay, and it's almost never for the reasons that they think it is. Like not building it is not okay. They would say because they want someone else to buy it, but it's actually scratching some itch for them that they can't get away from. Uh, let me. Uh, here's a, here's a really good example. We saw we see this a lot. People come in as consultants and they're making a lot of money in consulting. And we have this one guy. The company is now called Smart PM. It's doing quite well. The guy was a civil engineer, super super smart. Was being hired for like hundreds of thousands of dollars to come in at the end of construction projects when. The, the contractors and the investors in the construction project were getting in, into some legal battle about like it's, you know, the thing took too long and now there's, there's change orders and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars are on the line because there's a dispute. And he would get called in by, let's say, the investor who would say, I need you to prove that these guys had made some schedule changes that is what caused this to overrun and so they're trying to charge me for the change order but not... And he's thinking, well, here's what, I, here's what he was really good at. He could put it in a spreadsheet. He would figure out how to write down the formulas. It would take him a lot of time to do it, and he would charge them hundreds of thousands of dollars in consulting. And he thought, well, here's the business opportunity. I could build a product for them, which they could then use to solve that problem, and they don't have to hire me, and I can just automate it. It's the same product I did. And it turns out there's no authentic demand for that. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what, is he, what was he missing? Like he felt the demand to have this product for what he was doing, which is he was in a situation where he had to actually be able to go explain to them something so that they could get involved in this legal battle. And so he knew that that was hard to do, so he wanted a product for himself. But then he imagined that since that's what he was selling to people, that that's what they would buy. When in fact, that's not true. And it's weird, but it's hard to see. In that case, they were buying an advocate who could go to court with them or tell them what to say in order to get involved in this legal fight. Now, in order to do that, he had to get this, this data. And so when he, when he finally saw that, he began to realize, well, what was his product going to have to do for people? It wasn't just going to give them the answer. It was going to somehow be useful for them in some sort of way that they could use it to get involved in these arguments or maybe avoid these arguments in advance. So what did he do? That's what... So. I, we should go look at their website and see what they're doing now. But it's more or less that they empower people to be able to settle these kinds of disputes or or know ahead of time whether or not these disputes are going to arise. It's a very cool product, by the way. It looks at it looks at um, schedules and schedule changes and score, kind of scores them and says what's the likelihood that the what the contractor is predicting is going to happen is going to actually happen. Well, that's interesting. So if a guy says, "Oh, I could build you this building in like three weeks." They have some data that says that's unlikely. It, I think the example I remember would go something like this: They have this construction schedule, and in the construction schedule to build this thing, there's like seven staircases, and they have like one week to do a staircase. And what they didn't realize was that to do that staircase was going to get in the way of some electricians that were going to show up who needed to get up and down that mm. passageway. So instead of it taking a week, it was going to take two weeks to get that staircase done. But now they had six more to do, and so the the, per, the they would have to change the schedule. They didn't want to multiply each of those by two, but they would multiply each one of those by like let's say one and a quarter, thinking that they could work around it. So I see. So so the demand is from the people drawing up the contracts in the beginning, who could get maybe get in trouble later if the contracts are not satisfied correctly, and now there's a legal battle. So they can't. Their lives are stuck because they're always making these contracts, and someone's yelling at them like, "It's why didn't you write the contract correct?" And now it's a legal. Thing and, and it's even more than a contract. Yeah, so it's. I think it's also managing it along the way. So both sides have an interest. Initially, I I, I believe that they were convinced that the the side that mattered the most was the side that was being shown the change schedules. So the contractors were showing the change schedule, but the investors didn't have the expertise to actually be able to read those things. They would hire people, but they were very hard to follow. The, so the changes. So, so this now is the I, woman, but now I think it's on both sides actually. This is the woman who is going to be stuck with her screaming kids in the back of the boat, and but instead it's going to be on both sides, people making a deal and a contract, but they're going to be having screaming lawyers at them later or yeah, screaming and, managers at them later. Right, and so the, you see, the consultant didn't understand the demand. The consultant thought the demand was for the answer, 
but the consul- but the demand was actually to be able to be a participant in this argument uh, that were hiring him to do consulting so that they could argue with each other. But he was trying to now empower them to be involved in the argument in some way. It's so interesting because obviously this is very interesting for product development, but it's also very interesting for sales in every situation, right? Let's say you're asking someone out on a date. It has to, like, she's already filled up. I'm thinking me with <laughs> girls back in the day, women back in the day, <laughs> but she's already got her 24 hours a day, seven days a week filled up in her mind and her life. And I have to convince, if I ask someone out on a date, I have to convince them it's not not okay to go out with me on a date. Or I have to present the situation I love this where set. it's not not okay for, like like Brad Pitt has yeah. no problem. It's If Brad Pitt asks someone out, it's not okay to not go out with Brad Pitt on a date just for and maybe for And maybe for some married women, they have him on some list. That says, yeah, yeah. You know, like, so, so, but for me, much different situation than Brad Pitt. I have to somehow situationally, the, well, the situation, the words I use, everything has to. Yeah, so you got to be a little careful. I mean, uh, the way you said it if, and the way I did, gave those descriptions of those um, salespeople, I was actually saying, trying to say those as, uh, those are manipulative and sort of unethical. Yeah, that's how I always and, felt I had to and, ask out women. And I'm, and I'm thinking being unethical and manipulative, it can work, but it's, a manipul- it's unethical and manipulative. So what if you could actually understand the authentic demand? This ex- I love, for me, I love this example of thinking about like there's a woman that you're interested in because that's a lot of what founders or big companies, when you're doing innovation, you're actually feeling this kind of sense of unrequited love. Right, oh no, and then it's even called the honeymoon period when you first do a deal with somebody or first start working with somebody. Well, I'm thinking even before that, it's mm-hmm. like I'm looking across the room or someone's looking across the room and you're interested in that woman or that guy and you're interested in them and they just like you. You know, There's a big difference between they just like you and there's an authentic demand. But it, it's not manipulated in the sense though that like most people think they can't not not find a life partner or uh-huh. someone to date. They're lonely, they want to find someone to date. So part of the problem you already solved just by existing. So now, but some, but then they have other conditions. They want someone who is maybe over six feet or they want someone who makes a certain amount of money or they want someone who likes sports or, you know, or they, they think that they have some so, criteria. So this is so exactly on point because here's what people normally do mm-hmm. or what they, what they do, which we're, I would encourage them not to do, is they try to guess, they like talk to her for a little while and they find out like what movies they, she likes and then they pretend to like those movies. Or they try to they see how she's dressing or where she goes. They try to change their clothes to be. They try to become the thing that she would right. be interested in. Okay, so there's a wonderful movie that I I think kind of tells this point, which is Groundhog Day. So how did Bill Murray, you know, get the girl? He finally figured out that he was supposed to figure out like be really interested in her. Like just by being an interested in her, he became somebody that she was interested in. Yeah, which is a lot different than trying to make up how you're supposed to behave or how you're supposed to manipulate things so that she'll go out with you. Right. And, so, and I'm trying to say the same thing with customers. The job to do with customers is become so interested in them that somehow you become the thing that they're interested in, as opposed to trying to guess what you have to make so that they'll love you. Okay. So, so again, let's just. I want. I really want to nail it down. Uh, okay. In, mechanically. On practice. Okay. Yeah. Good practice. So, so I want to be an entrepreneur, and let's say I have a vague idea. And by the way. Companies, so be, part of being an entrepreneur is you start off with one idea, but you pivot sometimes to multiple ideas. And I'm suggesting bad idea. Okay. The only reason people call it pivot is they don't really know what they're doing. So right, well, but, our, but companies, you're suggesting our companies don't pivot. They actually, here's, here's start another way. Okay. Decide, I'm interested in the situation those people are in. I don't know what that means. Okay, like okay a, let's take healthcare. So healthcare, it's a, such a drag that every doctor you go to, you need to fax all this paper around. And I know companies have been working on this for decades, but why isn't there some like global healthcare internet that so they just yeah, so email step, them? So step one, I learned this from my own PhD advisor. There are important problems and then there are black holes. And you want to work on important problems that aren't black holes. You start out by telling me, here's a problem that everybody's worked on and no one solved. I'd say, let's not work on that one. Because, you know, unless you have an idea about how to solve it, I wouldn't go down that path. But if you said... Here's a place where there's a lot of things going on, and I'm pretty sure because human beings are human beings, they're stuck in some way that they don't yet see and I don't yet see, but I'm interested enough in them to go figure it out. So you, know, you have to pick places, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to pick places where you know something about it, 
Like we've had companies come in and say, we're really experts at uh, travel stuff. And we want to go into like the, the, you know, the trucking business. And we say, well, you know, here's a bad plan. It's going to take you a really long time to learn what the trucking business is like. And it's only after you know, the trucking business that you should go figure out some sort of innovation to do. So start out with some area that you know something about. So if you've never been a doctor, you've never worked in a, med- in a healthcare office, you've never sold to them, I'd say don't start there. Start with some place where you actually could know something, and we all know something. So start there. And then, and now it becomes more like the scientific method. And this is, um, this is to make it faster, to make it faster. If you just go and watch them, you will make up a story in your head about what they need. And it's just like if, you, if I gave you a thousand numbers in some pattern, you will find a thousand random numbers, you will find the pattern in it. Right. Every, so your brain is just going to make things up. So instead of that, we say, before you go out, describe what you think their situation is like and how they're coping with it. Just describe it. Like say, I think that they have a boss and I think that they've got a schedule and I think that they have a calendar that they have to maintain. And so right th- we, we have a two-by-two two matrix, which we describe in the book called a situation diagram. There's a set of activities that you think that they're carrying out. There's a set of resources or equipment that they use to carry those things out. There's a set of relationships, maybe with their boss, maybe their coworkers, maybe their spouse, that they have to maintain. And there's a set of channels that they use by which all those things move, move through. Sit down before you go have any of these conversations and just try to make a little situation diagram that describes for yourself what you think their life is like. And go and have a, a conversation, interact with them and see if you're right. And it's amazing if you go to someone and say, hey, James, I think here's how you do your podcast. I think you have someone else like booking the guests and I think you have, uh, um, you know, you, you rent a place to like do the podcasts and, you know, you get paid by the number of hours. I'm going to make up all these stories that try to explain what I, a simple thing that explains to me how I think your life is. It's not your life. It's how I think your life is. What we find, first off, is most people are not okay if you show up and tell them what their life is like and you got it wrong. Most people will just correct you. They'll say, no, that's not really right. I don't actually rent my equipment. It turns out I, I buy my equipment. Okay, so you go home and you rewrite it and say, okay, now if I understand this right, there are people who, here's how they do podcasts, they buy their equipment, blah, blah. And then I go try to find someone else and I go to them and then say, hey, you know, I've been talking to people about this. I hear this is what they do. Is this the kind of thing that you do? So the, you build these situation diagrams to see how people are currently coping in their life. When you do that after a while, the first thing that happens, which usually happens about five, six weeks into this, is you become incredibly depressed. Like almost 100% of the time, you become incredibly depressed because you start to realize, wow, these people that I thought had some demand that I was going to be able to fulfill, they actually know just what, their lives are perfectly fine, thank you very much. Everything, every place I'm looking to think that there's some authentic demand, uh-uh, it's not like that. So now, if you can get yourself to keep going, some anomaly shows up. Like in the case of uh, the, uh, my, my friends who did Florence Healthcare, the anomaly is, well, wait a minute, I never noticed that you were crossing these things out. Or, or you started, you, you, meant, you didn't bring it up to me, but you were like complaining that you had to go chase a doctor. Like on day one, if I had talked to you, you wouldn't have said to me that I had to go chase a doctor. But now I'm talking to you, and it just comes up, you're explaining to me you're not doing something else because you're going off and chasing a doctor. Aha, now I'm wondering, (laughs) okay, well, is there something that you're doing or not doing that's in the way that's going to keep you having to chase a doctor? And then you can start to think about product and going down that path. That's the work. That's what we call call those documented primary interactions. And you can really do it, and you can really get good at it. And you do about 10 or 15 of those a week. And... It's funny, it doesn't feel like progress. One of the things that's really interesting is like, and I think this is one of the things that makes us hard um, to do this work differently is when people are building product, they can see progress. Like I'm going to add this feature, add this feature, I'm going to go out and try to convince people to buy this. In this work, your work is to become less wrong. Every day your job is to become less wrong. It's also you're trying to figure out, you're trying to figure out what can't the customer not you're trying to see how they're stuck. You're trying to see them for being stuck. Right, and then you're trying to create something that once it's created, then they, once they start using it, then they can't not, not use it. Like Uber, I was fine in my life before Uber existed, but once Uber existed, yeah. I had to use it. Yeah, I mean, I use this example. You walk into a colleague's office, it just so happens that 
the mid, like it's a weird made up situation, but you start to see what it looks like. You walk into their office and you see that there's a, a bunch of nails on the table and there's some picture frames there. And it's weird because they're using the back of their iPhone to gently, really gently tap these nails into the hmm. picture frame. And you think to yourself, that's really silly. You know, I, they're not stopping. So you quick duck out, you grab the hammer that you had to happen to have in a drawer in your office, and you bring it in and you put it on their desk. It'd be really weird for them not to pick up, put down the iPhone and pick up the hammer. So they were stuck. They didn't even have a name for stuck. They weren't looking for a hammer. They were just going about their business. But you understood in how they were going about it that this was not okay. But, but they were okay with using the iPad, even they, though a hammer was just in the next office. Yes, but they're not actually okay. I mean, the, the thing you're... So you, have to, so you have to understand the subtleties of what's... Re- what are those moments... There might even just be moments that they don't even realize are happening, those moments where they're not okay with yeah. something. So the big opportunity is to see an authentic demand in which there's no consumption. That's what you're looking for. Like, nobody was looking for something that would automatically redact their papers. Nobody was looking for something that would go solve the Shazam problem. It, nobody could have described that problem to you. But if you actually can see it, you can actually see the situation in which a person is stuck and they can't even name it. In fact, one of the things that makes this sort of weird is the authentic demands that people identify, they don't really have names. You have to come up with like new noun phrases for it. Like, how, what's, what's the name for the person who needed the hammer in that section? Uh, uh, maybe there's a name because it's hammer. But a lot of these times, a lot of these things, people, if you, this is why you can't do this by. Um, uh, by survey, for example, like you can't survey people and say, "Would you like something that would do the following thing?" Because there's no name for that. Anyway, that's. But I like I, this idea of though. Then okay, here's some frustration that I've observed that just now, and and that's after lots of interactions and documenting op, my observations. Here's some frustration I'm seeing. Now here's a list of alter, alternatives. Here, like instead of the iPad. Maybe they he could, could, they, use right. a, could have picked up a shoe, right? Yeah, he could have picked up or a book, or we could give him a tiny little hammer because it's only a tiny nail. Like we don't have to go searching the whole office for. Yeah, a or the nails could have driven themselves and, or something. And right? just like with the Shazam example, oh, I could have an app which records it and then sends it on Twitter and crowdsources the solution. Now that might be a bad solution, but that's one alternative. Yeah, or, or, you, or yet they press a button and. A, Connects to an expert who will tell you something. Yeah, yeah. So and I'm and then and then there's an auction, a reverse auction. Like there how much go. will you pay for? So these are all bad solutions, and you have to kind of find the Maybe. least bad solution. Well, um, this. So let me see what I can if I can tell you what I think a product is. So in a situation in which a person is stuck, in which not doing something is not okay, you identify something that has to change. And now what your product is is something which when you introduce it allows the person to change and it overcomes immune reactions. Uh, I'll give you an example in the healthcare space. So uh, if a person, a typical thing people will say is, you know, I'm, they'll say, I know what I should do is go on a diet. And so you say, okay, well, you know you should go on a diet and, I, and yet you're not dieting. And you could say, you might say this, and this is a sort of technique, you'd say, um, well, suppose you could... Uh, you know, suppose you had to be on a diet for the rest of your life. You do this weird thing. You like push people. In, it's called breaching. You push people in the wrong direction. Instead of saying, well, like, what could I do to make it possible to be on a diet, which is what most people do, which doesn't seem to work, you go the other way. You say, well, okay, suppose you had to be on a diet for the rest of your life. What are you worried about? And some people will say things like this. Well, you know, I'm a gourmet. I, I've done a lot of work to like develop my palate. And you know, when I think of diet, I think of like having crappy food. Okay, well, you can go out in the market, and there are there are diets that you can buy in the supermarket, where they'll ship to you that advertise themselves as lose weight and have fantastic meals. You see, so it does this two things: it does the thing that you're reaching for, which is to be on a diet, but and the real thing you're worried about, and it takes off the table the thing that you're worried about. We call this grip to grip mapping. It's like somehow people are stuck doing the things the way that they're doing it because it allows them to have a grip on something but they really want to get a grip on something else. And the way that they think to get a grip on something else makes them worry they're going to let go over here. So what a product does is it allows people to go for this grip, which we call an aspirational grip, or what's what we think an authentic demand is. Not getting that grip is not okay. And they can do that without it, the product triggering the worry that they're going to let go of this, because that's what stops them from changing. 
So the work is to first identify the aspirational grip and then understand why it is that they can't themselves change the behavior. And then your product becomes the thing that actually allows them to move forward and, that's, and then doesn't trigger an immune reaction to not doing the, using your product. So this is really also incredibly useful for entrepreneurs right now who are stuck in a way to look at their product. Like, you know, A, can, are people okay with not using the product? Or not getting, got, not getting the grip. So the yeah. product is a thing, it's mud pie. Right. So you say, is it okay for the kid to not have a rela relationship with their mom? The answer is no. So, right. Yeah. So, so, so it's like this immune, there, there, there are these immunities to uh, uh, buying the full product. Like a, a woman down the street wouldn't buy a mud pie because it's made out of mud. Yeah, so right. You have to give her like tasty food. So you would notice <laughs> when presenting to this woman and you're documenting all these interactions, that, oh, she feels revulsion at the mud pie. So you're really selling something else to your mom yeah. Which is like, you know, family affection. So there are two big tools that I think we've invented or developed or refined. One is called situation diagramming. And that is, let's just understand for every person how they're managing to hold their life together. So there's some act there are activities they carry out or don't carry out. There's resources and equipment. There's relationships that they maintain. And then there's channels by which they do that. And we describe what those are. And then it's not just them. There's a whole bunch of people. They all, we all kind of revolve around each other. We're all kind of like living our own little business models. So you map that, you do that diagramming. And then you ask yourself, well, is there something in there that, they, that they're sort of stuck? They, they kind of, they, not having this resource is not okay, but they, that's really not what they would be drawn to have. And you see how they're stuck. That gives you the first clue. The second clue is this grip to grip. So why can't they change? Now you have to go in and see why they can't change. I'll give you an example just from a practical point of view. People, if let's say you've got a product and you discover that every time you bring people this product, they say to you, wow, that must cost a lot. Or they say to you, how much does that cost? And I would say, okay, let's just break that down. There's a behavior right there that's not okay. Like as long as they're asking you how much it costs, they're not buying. So you're, you want them, you're, you're drawn to have them buy. Let's say that you're all sort of pretty convinced that they should buy, but they keep asking you about the price. So what do you do about that? You know, before I had, we had any of these tools, I would have said, here's what most people do. They say, well, you know, how come you're, ask, how come you're asking about the price? They would say, you know, it's not that expensive. They would find some way, they would say, well, I can make it cheaper for you. They would guess at all these things. So I'm, I'm going to suggest a better way. A better way is try to find out whether or not there's, they're, they ha, they're not asking about the price is not okay. You, like asking about the price is a way that they have a grip on something. So here's what we train people to do, or here's what we suggest in the book to do. When someone says something like that, that's really in the way, it's a speech act that's in the way, you can say to somebody, and it's a weird thing, I, I hear you asking how much it costs. I'm kind of curious, like suppose you didn't bring that up at all, what are you worried about? It's kind of like saying, well, suppose you went on a diet. Like, what are you worried about? Like, well, suppose you didn't bring up the price at all. What are you worried about? And people say weird stuff. You don't know what they're going to say. You know, what, a typical thing they might say is, well, I don't want to have to bring something too expensive to my boss again because last time I did, they yelled at me. Hmm. So this isn't about price. This is about the fact your boss is going to be upset. <laughs> or they might say, well, you know, I've got a fixed budget now, but in September I'll have a different budget. So it wasn't that they were worried about price. They were worried about when you needed the money. And you don't know these things. But the way to start to map these things out, to actually go from, okay, they're trying to grip something, but instead of gripping it, they're doing something which is in the way, like asking you about price. And if they keep asking you about price, you want to get them to not do that. Well, so how do you get them to not do that? You ask them, well, suppose you didn't do that. What would, be, what would you be worried about? And if you have learned how to have those kind of conversations, it might eventually get to something which they have a grip on. Like, well, this is my way, they wouldn't tell you this, this is my way of not being yelled at by my boss. Or this is my way of not having to figure out how to get the money from the current budget until later. It, it's so funny because that, that works for, um, so that idea is great to kind of like, hey, if this wasn't on, if this wasn't a worry, what's, you well, know. If, well, if, no, you get them to generate the worry. So you said, suppose you did it. Like I, I'm trying to get them to, I'd get right, them to I breach. See. Like, well, suppose you, you know, suppose you never ask me about price again. What are you worried about? Because people, people, when you breach, they often can feel something. And I, and I've seen, I've seen like excellent salespeople 
use this in really high stakes negotiations. Mm -hmm. Like, Tell me. like I was in a meeting once, it was too, too hard to explain like what was being sold, but it was a very expensive product slash service. And uh, the, the, the CEO of the other company is like, why did you even bring me here? I'm going to spend X, Y, you know, da, da, da. Uh, and the guy who was running the meeting on our side said, listen, we just want to, we want to figure something out. So let's say we could do this all for you for free. What other, is there, is there really any other issue? Was price the issue or so he's done, he does See, what I think a, is what you're saying. No, it's actually a little bit different, right? So, um, and then, but then we found a base though to move forward. Yeah. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying mm -hmm. other things don't work. I'm, I mean, I've, you know, me a long time. I'm trying to introduce something new. That's a, a new set of tools. Actually, one of the things we've learned is that there are three different types of innovation. Like you can just get better at doing what you're already doing. So it's like make technical improvements to your product, which people just will reach for. You could try to get people to change how they go about doing things, which meets a lot of immunities. Or you could try to see things in a new way, which is kind of formative. One of the things we've learned is you need different tools in different situations. So it, you want to be really efficient about this. So if you're in a situation where there's a behavior that has to change, like they keep asking you about price and that's just in the way, or they keep asking you about doing a proof of concept and that's in the way. The move to make isn't to suggest I'll do it for free. The move to make, uh, a move to make that's really powerful, but it's really counterintuitive, is just suggest to them that they do exactly the opposite behavior. So if someone is like complaining to you about price, say instead of saying, well, I'll do it for free, now let's talk, you say, I hear you keep bringing up price. Suppose you didn't bring up price. What are you worried about? Mm. Because their behavior is not revealing to you what the issue is. If you say, I'm going to do it for free, you may not be talking about their issue at all. This may have nothing to do with price. Mm. They're just using the, the statement to protect themselves with something else. You see, when the person said, I'm not going to go on a diet, you could guess all day long for what's in the way. But if you said, well, suppose you did go on a diet, what are you worried about? That might surface the concern about being a gourmet. I see. So instead of saying, if you don't go on a diet, you might be unhealthy and die. Yeah. You say, well, let's say you go on a, let's say you do go on a diet, what's going to go bad in your life? Yes. Or you say, you know, you keep saying you're not going to go on a diet. Suppose you do go on a diet. I see. So in this case, like the, in the meeting I described, the guy could have said, um, well, let's say you spend this money. What, what are you worried about? Yeah, what what bad things going to happen at your company? Yeah, and the By guy the way, could say it's a cliche, but that guy the guy could say, well, we're going to go bankrupt if we keep spending money on stuff like this. Okay, and so there are a lot of things you're spending money on that could drive you bankrupt. Why are you worried about this thing driving you bankrupt? Right. But what we learn is the reason we call it grip to grip mapping, or is that people are trying to get to an if it's a not not for them. So if you've actually identified that staying in this situation is not okay, so therefore it's not okay to not leave the situation. That's a better way of saying it. So it's not like they have to leave the situation. It's just that staying in the situation is not okay. All the paths currently leave them the situation. Let me just talk about that stuckness for a second. There's this wonderful um, uh, interview. I forget who it was with, and I forget who, oh, who was the... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a story in the book, but there's a musician, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Who was that? Oh, it's Paul, Paul Simon. Yeah. yeah. So he's Oh, being, yeah, and he, he said he was... He was stuck. Yeah, he was describing, someone was asking him, the interviewer was asking him, so tell me, like, how did you come up with that song? And he said, well, I started with, I don't know if it was Beethoven or something, and got to this point, and then we were stuck. I was stuck. And the interviewer made this great, asked this great question. He said, well, what do you mean by stuck? He said, you know, stuck. Like, every direction I was going wasn't getting me where I wanted to go. See, that's, the, that's what stuck means. Like, every direction they're going isn't getting them where they want to go. So what you're looking for is... a person in that situation, so every direction they're going isn't getting them where they want to go. So where they want to go is they want to get a grip on something. But every direction they're currently going doesn't get them there. So now you discover something that, that would have to change because that's a direction they would have to go or that would have to be a direction they stop going in. But when you ask them to do that, you discover that there's other thing that they have a grip on, that the current thing that they're doing is allowing them to hold on to that grip. So how do you figure that out? Well, if you find someone for whom... Losing, not losing weight is not okay. Like everything they're doing is causing them to gain weight or not lose weight. You find that out and you find something that they're currently doing that's in the way. Like, or not doing in this case, I'm not dying, that's in the way. So that's a path I'm not taking. And you, and you say, let me try to understand why that path is a path you're not taking. So suppose you were to diet. See, that's the move to make. Suppose you were to go in that direction. 
What are you worried about? And at that moment, it's amazing how often people can reveal to you that makes me worried about something. Right. So, so, so really, and this is what you've always yeah. told me. Just in, and I, I'm going to say yeah. very simply what you, what I feel like you've been telling me for ten years is that you there's much more information in a no than a yes. People could say yes to you for many reasons. Like they could, the guy at eBay could say yes because he just wants you out of the room. He just, and yeah. and not see you for six months. So he says yes. Come back when you. I love this. Yes, this is great. Come back when you build the product because he really just wants to go on to his next meeting. Um, potentially, I'm just making that up. Or, but, but no, you can get some co informational content out of that if if they're introspective enough. Yeah, and of course that's 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 true, and and that's more. And that's, but there's more to it than that, which is which is this: if you try to stop people from going in the direction that they're already choosing to go, the fact that you can't stop them, from, the fact you can't change their direction, there's information in that. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So currently they're not dieting. So I say to them, well, suppose you had to diet. Suppose you dieted. I'm trying to change their direction. And if people are resistant to the change, you can try to understand, well, on what basis are they resistant to the change? Because that's what you have to overcome to be able to be helpful to them. Like they can't themselves start dieting. They're drawn to diet. And so instead of saying, well, what can I do to make the diet more palatable to you? Which I'm not sure they have access to. What you do is you you try to you try to force them to go in the other direction, literally. Like you say, okay, well, suppose you did diet. Like now, what are you worried about? Do you think this works in politics? So let's say I ask someone who you're voting for, and they tell me, you know, Bob Smith. I'm voting for Bob Smith. Well, why are you voting for Bob Smith? Do you think it's more likely they don't really know why? So so, is it not interesting? why they're voting for Bob Smith? Is it more interesting why they're not voting for, you know, Jack Brown? I would say, as I do, it's a, it seems to me very safe to say people do not know why they make their decisions. Right. But, but they, they make up stories about it, but they don't actually know. If it, you Think about it this way, James. If people really knew why they did things, you could ask them what you would need to make for them to, that they would buy it. And then you would just make it and they would buy it. I mean, a lot of this work comes from all the obvious things don't work. Like if you ask people what to make, they'll tell you and you make it, it doesn't work. If you ask them if you make it, will they like it and buy it? They'll say yes and then they don't buy it. I'm trying to point out that the direct method, the, sort of the obvious method is the, is the waking dream. It's like, here's how we're in the waking dream. This is what we think people do. This is, but and, it seems like if you push people in the direction of what's making them uncomfortable. Okay, let's say you go... Let's say you do the thing that makes you uncomfortable. What's the bad thing that's going to happen? So let's say you vote for the guy you don't want to vote for. What's the world? What's the bad thing that's going to happen? Might give you more information than why are you voting for this other person? I had never thought about it, but but it seems plausible, right? So if you uh, like, I might say I might not vote for someone because I don't like their stance on Russia, Ukraine, or uh, women's rights or whatever. But if I say I'm voting for someone, it might be I just think he's better than alternatives or so, my wife's voting for him. So I'm voting for whoever my wife. So, so, so all the things you say, but you know, just to be accurate, this works, this, this theory, this approach works. You got to start with some place where there's already an authentic demand. Mm -hmm. So I can't just say like, you know, you've revealed to me nothing about dieting. Like you don't care about your weight, anything. And then I come to you and I say, well, so, you know, suppose you started dieting. And like you're like, why are we talking? Like you don't care. Like mm. you know, you have to start somewhere where there's a grip that they're trying to get. So if you walk up to someone and say, "I'm curious, like you know, why are you voting for that person versus this person?" I don't know what you're going to learn. It's this stuff makes sense in the context of somebody is trying to get somewhere, and they're stuck. And then you, as the entrepreneur, can do something perhaps which will get them unstuck. Yeah, no, this makes a lot of sense. I can think about it in terms of like writing. Okay, I want to write. A thriller novel. Everybody in the world wants to write their novel, okay? I want to write a thriller novel. And yet every year that I say to myself on January 1st, this year I'm going to write a thriller novel, by the end of the year I don't write the thriller novel. Yeah. So what you're saying is not like why didn't I write the thriller novel. Let's say you wrote the thriller novel. What are you afraid is going to happen? Actually, so this is a great example because the trick is the, the existence of the thriller novel is an outcome. We actually get down to a super detailed level of what we call behavior. And I'd say, what are you doing or not doing in, in different situations that's in the way of your writing the novel? And I'd ask you to make a list. So, for example, you might say, in the morning, when I 
could write, I'm, I'm not writing. Okay, that's a behavior, not writing in the morning. How do I know it's a behavior? I just, see. And then you could say, like, if you were writing in the morning, what's, what's wrong? So step one, and this is something to learn from the theory that Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy at Harvard came up with about immunities to change is, the trick is to make a list of all those things that you can think of. Mm. Be because if you make a list of all those things and you stare at them, and you say, okay, well, I'm not writing in the morning, and that's that's a negative thing, I'm not writing in the morning. And you could also say, I open up CNN in the morning. That's a positive thing. So either you have to stop opening up CNN or you have to start writing. So you make a list of all these things you're doing or not doing that are in the way of trying to get the script. Mm. The reason that's important to do initially is you have to see them all and then ask yourself the following, or make the following observation. Aha, if none of these change, I'm not going to be able to get that grip. And the reason that's important is now that creates an authentic demand for at least one of these changing. Because and now, now that you know that at least one of these changing, I can say, okay, let's pick one and see if we can change it. Or it could be that I just don't really want to write the novel. I'm just saying I do. Well, or or it discover or you discover one of those things that could change would be easy to change, and you don't have to worry about it. You just mm -hmm. change it. That's right. that, that happens a fair amount of the time. But then you might say, okay, well, let's say in the morning I I have to stop looking at CNN. And you say, okay, well, it's January 1st. I'm going to make myself a commitment, a New Year's Eve commitment, and I'm not going to watch CNN. And then you discover like three weeks later, you're watching CNN again. You know, it's like what happens with gym memberships. They all start, you know, gyms are full in January. They're less full in February and they're empty by March. People make these commitments, but they can't hold them. So that's what you're looking for, the things that don't, you can't change. That's where you become valuable to the customer or to yourself. So now I might say to you, okay, James, it's pretty clear that as long as you keep watching CNN in the morning, you're not writing, that's for sure. So if nothing else, we have to stop that. But it sounds like you've tried and you can't. So let me go the other way and say, suppose you never got to watch CNN ever again. This is kind of move to make and make it all or nothing because that helps people focus. What would you be worried about? And people say all sorts of weird things. I mean, I love the examples from Bob Keegan's book. If we have time, I'll tell you the story from Bob yeah, Keegan's yeah. book. So Bob Keegan tells this wonderful story about himself when he's trying to lose weight. And so it was so so illustrative. He said he he there are times when he really wants to lose weight, and he makes a list of things he's doing or not doing. And one of those things is he goes out to his, with, to dinner with his wife on a Friday night, and the wait, the server comes over and offers a dessert menu, and he's and he says yes, and he finds if he he can convince himself on January first to not say yes, but then like a month or two later he's ordering dessert again. So that would be something to change. And so you go through the following, he tells her the following story, which is like so amazing. He said, well, okay, suppose I never get to order, I never say yes to a dessert menu ever again. He said, well, the first thing I worry about is my father. And you say, well, what, what does this have to do with your father? And he says, well, why would bringing up your father? He says, well, I think about my father and the fact that he grew up during the Depression. Well, what does your father in the Depression have to do with ordering this. He says, well, I think about when we were young and my father was working really hard, he explained to me that he never he was working that hard because he didn't want me to feel deprived. Well, what does this have to do with anything? He says, well, if I don't, if I deprive myself, then I'm not being the father, the, 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 I'm not living the life my father was working so hard to have. Mm -hmm. And so he realizes in this weird kind of chain of logic that he was able to maintain a grip on being the person that he that you know, making his father's life meaningful or somehow consistent by ordering cake because he wasn't by ordering cake he was being not deprived and he's, and when you realize that you realize okay well what's the chances he's going to stop ordering cake if that means to him that he's like denying all the work that his father did to have a life which is not deprived mm -hmm. that's what's in the way the point of that is What's in the way is really weird usually. It's psychological, it's deep, people don't have access to it. He could never have told it to you if you said, well, suppose you just order the cake, you know, just order the cake. Or suppose you, you know, it's like, um, or you, know, you could give him all sorts of positive things to do, but the way to elicit this, the way to sort of be an entrepreneur and see how you could be helpful to somebody is to identify the behaviors that if they don't change, cause them to be stuck which they can't tell you about initially because you don't see them clearly enough. And then you figure out 
whether or not they can change them themselves. And if they can't, you can become a pro you can build a product. And you describe all these methods, like in the situational diagramming, the with stories, documented have. interactions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's almost like you're, it's like, okay, we know there's innovation, but, uh, and we know innovation is possible all the time, all over the world. And, but you have to kind of like drill for oil because if it was easy, it would have already been innovated. Like that's why innovation yeah. still there. Are, there's always a frontier of innovation because it's not obvious what the next. And it, you know, it's funny we didn't uh, I, we didn't actually start the, the podcast talking about that, but the place this all starts is how come so much innovation fails? How come so much startups fails? How come people build things and then they it fails? Sometimes they fail because founders have a fight about something, or sometimes they fail because there's the money's not around. But mostly they fail because they make things and then people don't care. They're just indifferent to it. Mm. So the puzzle is, for me, the, or for us, the puzzle was two parts. One part was, how come you don't notice that people were indifferent? <laughs> because you're thinking that they can't be. And then how could you, how could you actually go about trying to figure out a non-indifference up front? Because if you can figure out an authentic demand up front, when you build it, you can be pretty confident that people will reach for it because you know on what basis they're reaching for it. I don't know what, how, to, how we got to that point in this, but that's, but yeah, so the whole point of this is could you go about this in a way that is um, less accidental or like more, in, in you know, like it's more post enlightenment? I mean, this is the weird thing for me, and I don't know what to make of this. It's like, um, you know, it's like discovering that germs kill people in the, when you operate on them and trying to convince doctors who never heard of a germ or who didn't think that it could possibly matter that they should like wash their hands and change their clothes before they operate. It just doesn't make any sense. But once they see it, then they have to somehow operate in a sterile field. The thing we're talking about in this book is there are things that you could just notice about what makes someone a customer. Like there, there should be a not, not. There just has to be. Mm -hmm. And in every situation. Right, because then it's okay for them to do something else. Then they, it's like the gyms. They stop you going to the gym. Right. And then you can say, well, how come I don't know that there isn't a not, not? Why do I think there's a not, not? And the answer is because we all live in this kind of fantasy world that we think we know why people are making decisions and what they're doing. And we never go and check. And so then the question is, well, how would you go and check? And it's a little bit for us, like setting up, if you decide you want to have a sterile operating room, you have to hire someone who sets up the sink with the soap and you have to have put a clock on the wall because you have to wash your hands for 15 seconds and you have to have someone watching you as you're operating because you can't remember not to touch the back of your head as you get an itch, which causes you to now not be sterile. You have to put all these mechanisms, you put a, a sort of simple framework process in place to protect yourself from these kind of waking dream thoughts that are in the way of you're actually seeing what the authentic demands are. That's what we found that we did at Flashpoint in this process, and that's what we try to describe in the book, that people could set it up for themselves or set it up for others so that they have some chance of being protected from building things that they think people won't be indifferent to, but they'll actually be indifferent to. I mean, it's so fascinating because throughout the book and also throughout our discussions through the years, it's so interesting how you take kind of the, what do you call the, when, when you see not the image, but the reverse image? Oh yeah, the negative space yeah, we the, call the, it. Yeah, the negative space. Like you look at the whole negative space of, the, of a problem and you know, it's not like what's the problem, it's what's the negative space of the problem. And from there you can see what this outline of the real problem. It's a million years ago, you had a, a magician on your podcast. I, yeah. happen, I happen to be visiting you in New York when you so had that Steve, studio. Steve Cohen. Steve, yeah. Well, no, he, Steve. Wasn't, he wasn't a magi magician. He was, there was a, uh, he was an Asian guy who had a show. Oh, David Kwan. Yes. Yeah. And he, he described something, which I, I'll just show you how he was doing. What he, I just think it's so great to see. So the magician's problem, it's not a, he's not an entrepreneur, but he has a problem, which is he's up on stage and he needs a volunteer to come up from the audience and pick a card. That's his problem. So if you just say, you know, anyone who wants to come up on stage, nothing happens. Magicians have learned over a lot, with a lot of trial and error that if you do the following, almost always someone comes up on stage. Here's what you do. And if you do it wrong, it doesn't work. Like here's, if you, you say to somebody, you right there, and it has to be someone who's looking at you, um, would you mind standing up for me? Thank you very much. And you get everybody's attention on them. And you say, uh, give them all a round of applause. Please uh, come up on stage. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Now, if you say to the person, and they come, almost always come up, 
if you say to the person, uh, you, sir, would you please stand up and come up on stage? They sit there. Okay, what's going on? It's like the same information content. But it turns out the magician is creating a situation in which the guy really doesn't have a choice. You first say, please stand up. You know, someone asks you to stand up and all eyes are on you. What's the big deal? You stand up. And now you say, please, everybody, encourage him to come up on stage. And now he's disappointing everybody. Yeah. And so the thing that to do, try to do is to try to see how the situation creates these not-nots in which people can't really not do something. And what I'm suggesting, and what's hard to see, is we're all thinking in this sort of positive space. We're explaining to ourselves why people do things. Maybe I should have started there. And I said, like, why would, he, why would eBay buy? Because it saves them $40 million. Okay, but what about the negative space? Like, is it okay for them to not buy? Which is all the other possibilities. And the answer is yes. So yes, it makes sense for them to buy, but it also makes sense for them not to buy. Therefore, they're not customers. And, and I, I'm always thinking one step further, just as a practical business. Okay, you're looking at it. Do they want this product or do they not want this product? What's the real demand? But you could create a kind of uh, either inauthentic demand, but still demand, or maybe it borders on authenticity where you could say, okay, so I can put you down for a $50,000 audit of your bot situation, you know, and then yeah, I, and I, you, you know, could have still done business with them probably right on the uh, spot there. Yes, yeah, so I teach this stuff to a lot of people, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the things that's hard for you know me thinking ethically about it is, okay, well, I'm showing people that it's all about you know, subtract the negative space so you get the behaviors you want. Get, take, take off the table all the things that they could all do an alternative so you'll get them to do this. That's very manipulative. And you could do that, but you could also do something which is better for the world, I think, is you find out where people are trying to go already and see why they can't get there and enable them to get there. And when you do that, it doesn't feel like a struggle. Yeah, I no, I agree with you. And the the reason I propose the technique I just proposed is that you think they really need this. And by the way, they think they have a mathematical way of thinking, oh, it saves us $40 million. So you're removing another obstacle to them saying no, that was easier for them, Yeah, which is to delay. No, I love this. Right. So I don't think saving, I, for me, for, maybe saving $40 million, let me start someplace else. Like and it's so confusing because it's thing, things, seem, things that seem so obvious just aren't right. Like, I can't tell you how many people are telling entrepreneurs or innovators, make things that people want. You should make things people want. It's just it can't be right. And the reason it can't be right is just think of something you want that you don't buy. And think of something else you want that you don't buy. There's so many thing, more things that you want that you don't buy than there are things that you buy. So if you as an entrepreneur or as a, as a company make things that people want, you're just much more likely to be making something they want they don't buy. It's just much more likely. That doesn't solve it. So then people say, well, let's solve it by making it be they really want it. So like, let's make things that people need. That also doesn't work because just think of all the things you need to do that you never do. You don't really want to do that. So rather what you're looking for is try to see what, where people are trying to get to. They're, like Paul Simon was trying to get to the end of a song or someone is trying to get to a place where they don't feel the same way as they feel at the current weight. See where they're trying to get to. And then see what's in the way of their getting there. And see if you can free them to get there. That seems to be a much more powerful way to go. Because if you do that, people follow you home. That's that's the experience that our entrepreneurs have. No, and that's that's definitely the best and, and most pleasant, uh, authentic demand on both sides. But like, for instance, when I was telling American Express they needed to have a website... I had I had a vision for what I thought was the future. Maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong. But I expressed my vision to them and they ag- agreed enough that they re- felt at that moment that they couldn't do without a website. And I turned out I was correct. But was it manipulative me convincing them they needed a website? Uh, uh, or what, and, you know, their outcome was they wanted to spend their marketing dollars in the best possible way and I really felt this was the best possible way. So, oh, so that's important. Mm-hmm. So, you know, of course, you know, it's, was it really? So, uh, you have to be the. If you went into that thinking, I'm just doing this because I want them to spend money on me, and I'm going to make something, and no one's going to ever visit the website. That would never work. Well, I think it could work. It's it like, it could work. I've never been able to make it work because I've okay. only been able to sell something. Like this is my fault as a salesperson. I could only sell something I believe in. 
not for any ethical reasons. I'm just a horrible salesman if I don't believe in it. <laughs> yes. So I think that's good. Because I know all the sales techniques you could possibly know. I've had every salesperson on this podcast in the and world. I don't know if anybody in the podcast audience cares about this, but I, I care about it. The, the other difficulty that you also, that one can also have in this situation is it's colonialism. Like you can decide these customers would be a lot better off living their lives the way I think they should live their lives. Right. And so I'm going to kind of convince them to buy it because I think they're better off. I think that's possible. It just what we're what, what I'm learning is it's so much easier and sh- and clean, clearer, and things happen so much faster and bigger if Absolutely. you go in this other direction. Like figure out who they are, figure out which way they're already impelled, figure out what's in their way, get those things out of the way, and they'll buy that from you. A- Absolutely, which is ultimately the direction I wish I had gone in, which would have been a product direction, because then I don't have to impose my vision on anybody. They're right. just if it if it truly is solving a problem in the world, then there will be this authentic demand. So I knew that there was people had websites. Uh-huh. So I knew that there was going to be, you know, that the industry was going to change because it was going to be easier to make websites and it was going to be easier to maintain them and cheaper. But for whatever reason, I didn't go that direction. There were some, you know, I needed to always be a service business because I couldn't afford to be a product business. I think by what you're saying, and also I, I knew you back then, so mm-hmm. I kind of have a sense of what the timing was, what the, mm-hmm. the framework was. Um, our whole schooling system, for the most part, kind of teaches us to trade our time for dollars. Yeah. Like, you know, even it makes me crazy when I think about it, but you, know, you go to a classroom and you spend an hour there, and if you don't spend the hour there, they're not going to give you a good grade, then they give you homework to do or specific things to do, which are tasks which they then reward you with a grade. So like our whole educational system is somehow set up to make it feel as though your job is to do something for somebody in return for some reward. And so then you come out of school and you're looking around for a job. And so if you are just oriented that way, when you walk into these people's office and you're thinking, well, they should pay me for something yeah, and no, they'll I pay me totally, for the job. Yeah, I was totally falling into that. I was even ashamed the first time I ever hired somebody to like the first time I delegated like some software development, I felt guilty because <laughs> I felt like, no, the client hired me to write the software, Yes. even though I was delegating it and I was going to check it and I was going to be responsible for delivering it. So I had to go over everything. I felt bad going out that night while I knew someone was in the office working on software that I was paying them to do, but it wasn't my mentality to, to do that. Yeah. And so here's a, here's the shift. The shift is see the customer for who they are in the sense of in this situation, how are they experiencing it as being stuck, even though they can't tell you. See how it is that they themselves can't do something or stop doing something in order to get unstuck, and then provide that for them. You could provide that for them if you're a consultant. You could say, well, here's you're you're stuck because you don't want to go into the courtroom and have a fight with the you know you're the, you're the money people and you don't want to have a fight with the construction people. Because you're sort of an unbalanced fight, and so you need me to come along with you. Okay, now you're selling consulting services. Okay, but is there something? Is there some other way you can see it? Like, how is it that the only way they can make forward progress is by asking for a consultant? Like, what if they didn't ask for a consultant? Like, what what would go wrong? And going down that path will sometimes lead you to a place where you see something which is more like a product or a technology or something that someone else would do. Yeah. So, I mean, look, we've We've had thousands of hours of these discussions, I feel, and there's always so many fascinating stories, so many insights. It's changed the entire way I've, I've looked at entrepreneurship and, and other areas of my life, this kind of negative space aspect, the, the not, not philosophy. And, you know, I knew you for years, you've been thinking about writing a book, you've been writing a book, now you've written a book, you guys have it out. It's great. So many stories. Uh, and again, I've heard a lot of the stories, not all of the stories, and I've heard a lot of the techniques, but not all the techniques that you outline in here. And it was still a great read, despite the fact that I've knew a lot of the things. And uh, again, such a pleasure that it's finally out and we can actually talk about it on this podcast. I've been dying to talk about it on this podcast for years. So finally, you know, the heart of innovation, a field guide for navigating to authentic demand. Finally, it's out. Congratulations. Hopefully, what's your goal? You want it to be the best seller on business ever? (laughs) Uh, Well, I think you're the one who said we could have two out of three things. We could make money or have a lot of people read it, or it could actually be something that people would 
know something else about or, us. Or, about. or bestseller list. So the three things are. Oh, bestseller you, list. Yeah. The three right. things are, and you can only have two out of three, bestseller list, sell a lot of copies. Uh, and now I'm forgetting the, the thing you just said. Uh, uh, was it? Make money. Make, you make a lot of money. So we're not trying to make money with it. Right. Uh, uh, partly because you convinced me it's really tough to do and yeah. it's not actually where, where we're at. And you're not trying to make the best out of us. I mean, it would be great if it happened. I'd like it to be the case. So this is incredibly useful and, you know, people are stuck. Yeah. Right? So if, you, if you've if you got a business and you feel like, and you have a sense of, well, there's just, I'm close to something, but there's something much bigger. Like my friend Jim Balcom, he's like at 6 million in sales and you figure there's got to be some way to get the 75 million. I'm just not seeing it. I'm close. There's a lot in this book for that. If you're just an individual and you're trying to figure out for your own life, like I, I could like learn a lot of skills and get a job, or I'm really kind of interested in actually becoming of value to somebody. So I want to figure out how to like, what's my deep gladness that meets the world's deep hunger? There's a lot in this book for you, which is, I didn't know, by the way. We had entrepreneurs come back and tell us. I thought they would say, you guys helped me raise money. You guys like helped me figure out product. That's not what they said. They said we changed their lives because it made them able to see their relationships with their spouses and their friends and themselves better. Right, because it, ta- it talks about how to, how to, what to listen for when you're listening. It's not enough just to listen. You got to know what you're listening for. And it talks about, uh, you, you talk, I have a whole section about radical candor, candor and uh, uh, it, it does change you personally to be in the mindset to see these hidden problems in life. Yes. So that's our hope for the book, that we make that available to people. And we're also in the process of setting up um, a studio to build companies with people who would like to build companies with us. So the book is useful for that. If people would like to build companies the way we're hoping to build companies, they want to invest in those companies. The book makes it possible for people to see what we're doing. I think also it's useful for people who coach entrepreneurs or leaders because you know one thing about any field you're trying to get better at it's very easy, like you said, you see a bunch of numbers, you're gonna fill in a pattern. So if I watch uh, you know, a bunch of people play golf really good, I could make my own judgment about what they're doing good, but I'm not a golfer, so my judgment's probably gonna be really off. Whereas if I even knew a little bit about golf, I could, and, I, and, I knew how, and if I knew more about coaching golf, then I could help others, you know, as opposed to, me trying to find a pattern out of nothing. And maybe that's our not not is I have to say that a lot of what's in here comes from our coaching and working with founders and even working with ourselves and trying to notice what it is that we're noticing about the founders that's in their way. And I think a lot of that is in here. That's a really good insight. You know, I got, I got that insight just the other day because I'll just tell you a brief story. I'll leave it on the podcast. But I was having a chess lesson from my coach and he could, I would say something and he's like, you've been looking at games again from the database. So and I'm funny. like, what do you mean? He says, I could tell you've been looking at uncommented games. You saw this situation in the game. You came up with a theory of why they made a move, but your theory is totally wrong. And like, you need to only look at commented games, games commented by That's so fascinating. Yeah. How did he know? Because- He just, he just recognized Because he's, he, he, he's like, why did you make this move? And I, I said, oh, isn't this the move that is made here? I'm, um, oh, and then I so and then I backfill the story like oh I'm making space for my knight to go here or whatever. And he's like no no your knight's completely ineffective here. You saw Kramnik make this in the game, but in his game I know the game you're referring. To. In his game he had this situation. It's so he mud was really, pie. So you're telling me all moves are mud pie. Like you yes. you see the move and you're making up a story in your head and it's not real unless you have like a foundation yes. for un- why uh, moves are made. And in order to get that foundation, you have to listen to a lot of expertise and, and, or I listen to at least a lot of information that, that could inform you. And you have to have some methodology for how to listen. Which I, what I love about that is in some ways you're saying that your coach recognizes when you're just like following someone else's opinion yeah. or you have a way of thinking about it yourself. Yeah. And he's trying to offer you ways to think about it yourself that are, that are useful. Right. And that's what we're doing here too. Is like when I say you could just listen to other people's advice and make people things that people want. So you ask them, do they want it? Or you could ask yourself, here's a way to think about it yourself. You can figure it out for yourself. Are the alternatives okay for them? And if the alternatives are okay for them, you can know they haven't quite figured it out yet. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, it's so interesting. That's really interesting. I love, uh, I can see you getting better at chess already. So. Hopefully, knock on uh, 
so I'm not going to catch. It's very funny. <laughs> well, Barrett, thanks can, once again. Can, the can heart I, of innovation. Can I thank you before? I sure. Mean, this book doesn't exist without you. So first of all, you're like a role model for anyone who ever wants to ever write something that people can read. And you know how stuck we've been trying to figure this out. I mean, not stuck like Paul Simon, but stuck like us. It's taken us years to figure out how to write this. And there were so many moments when you said things that were helpful. When you, oh, I appreciate when, that. When you know, there's like a million things you could do. You could try to self-publish. You could try to get a publisher. You could get an agent. Didn't understand any of those things. So just the fact you helped us navigate that. But also, I remember you telling Matt as he was writing one of our co-authors, my business partner and friend, he said, you said, just you're like you're telling, you're making it too complicated. Just bring the reader into the situation and like just bring them there like you're a fly on the wall. Little things like that that you said, which I know you're trying to get that kind of messaging out in other places, it's just incredibly valuable. And thank you for getting us unstuck. Oh no, I appreciate it. And and the final result is amazing. I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad you followed my advice. But you you had it in there, right? You had all the stories. You you got when we were just having the conversation. You had all these great stories. And I just said, just write it down. <laughs> just write it down. That was all it took. Just write. Yeah. So I wish it was that easy, but it, yeah. Anyway, so thank you Maybe so much. Maybe it was that easy. Uh, thanks. Maybe it was. <laughs> it all just well, took time. Thank well, thank you, you so Merrick. Much. And then, and look, you've and been thanks. on the podcast before. You'll, you'll come on again many times, I'm sure. That'd be great. Thanks. Good to see you. Loki, the trickster god, has betrayed you. Find him, and vengeance shall be yours. Explore vast and mysterious realms. And battle gods and monsters. Enter Chaos, Asgard's Wrath 2. Available now, only on MetaQuest. Learn more at AsgardsWrath2.com. See Child Safety Guidance Online. Accounts for 10+. plus. Asgard's Wrath 2 is for ages 17+. plus. It's time to save. Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, take an extra 25% off clearance. All sales are final. Hurry, shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see NordstromRack.com or ask a store associate for details.